Secretary since the sad passing of the late John Hume. I did write to express, of course, the condolences of the Assembly to Pat Hume and her family, but I also want to ensure that the Assembly has the ability to pay its tribute to such a figure in the normal way in due course. Members should be aware that my office is liaising with the SDLP directly in relation to the timing of the formal tributes to both John Hume and John Dallet when business resumes in September, when members will be given the proper time to record their own reflections. Before I move on to the uh, main item of today's uh, business members, I'd just like to make some introductory remarks on the upcoming debate. Uh, and I, I will move to formally commence the debate very shortly. Um, but I just want to make these general remarks. Members will be aware that we announced the establishment of the Youth Assembly here in the Chamber in July. And in the last week, we have heard the voices of many of our young people on the matters that we are gathered to discuss today. It is not for me, of course, to make any comment on the issues involved this afternoon, and clearly we are in very unusual and challenging times. But I do have a role in being concerned about how the Assembly is perceived and in public, uh, and building public confidence in this institution. So there may well be many people watching our business for the first time today. And I would therefore ask all members to bear that in mind in terms of how we conduct this very important debate. Finally, the Assembly was recalled today on the basis of a motion with cross-party support. Clearly, circumstances have changed significantly since the original motion was tabled. However, I want to record some slight disappointment that I was in a position this morning of having to select between a number of amendments which, for the most part, shared very common principles. I think it would have, been helped, it would have helped proceedings today and have been a much more positive message if a cross-party amendment had have, uh, been presented to update the motion. I don't want to dwell on that any further, obviously, now, but I would ask all parties to reflect on that for the future. So we are mindful that there are people watching today, many young people of a new generation, who have a direct interest in these issues. So let us ensure that the debate is constructive and formative from the perspective of those people watching on. So on that basis, then, members, I'll move on to the main item of the agenda. Uh, there is one substantive item on the order paper, a motion on the AS and the A-level grading crisis, and I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly is deeply concerned that the modelling used to calculate grades for AS and A-levels has awarded incorrect results for students across Northern Ireland, and calls on the Minister of Education to award students the highest of their AS, teacher predicted or CCEA grades for A-levels, AS-levels and GCSEs due to exceptional COVID-19 circumstances. Thank you. And, uh, Paul Diamond, Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow you up to two hours and 30 minutes for this debate. Your amendment has been selected, Mr Crossan, and is published on the uh, Marshall list. Please now move the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I uh, welcome you back to your duties after being off for uh, a few months, uh, and wish you well in resuming those duties, uh, and also to thank the Assembly and parties for supporting the recall petition that I felt was so absolutely necessary uh, in order to have this debate uh, today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I first of all start by? Yeah, move the. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I raise to move the motion and, and the amendment. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Um, yeah. um, thank you. By convention, where a member or a minister seeks to amend their own motion, they are invited to address both the motion and the amendment within the 10 minutes allocated. So, therefore, you will have 10 minutes to address both, both the motion and the amendment. All other speakers will have five minutes. So, Mr. McCrossan, please open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to um, speak on the motion and the amendment as uh, proposed to uh, the House. But before I do so, I think it's important to follow on from the uh, comments made by the Speaker of this House in relation to the SDLP former leader, former MEP, MP, MLA, uh, and uh, a peacemaker, uh, John Hume. Uh, it came uh, uh, with great sadness that we learned of John's death. Uh, he has been unwell for some time, as many uh, will have known, uh, and unfortunately, in the circumstances that we were faced with during COVID, uh, we could not give uh, John the send-off that uh, we would have liked, uh, albeit he got a, a really lovely 
uh, send off uh, in his own home city in Derry. Uh, I know that many would have loved to have lined the streets and paid tribute to him and comfort his family and to say thank you to John for the huge sacrifices that he has made that undoubtedly and absolutely has benefited each and every one of us and our children of this society as well. And I welcome the uh, speaker's remarks that we will have an opportunity uh, in September, hopefully, to pay tribute to him because he was uh, 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 of such significance to this place that um, history will only properly reflect it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have asked for the support of parties in recalling the Assembly today, very importantly to ensure that uh, the concerns shared by young people, parents, teachers, uh, and the public right across Northern Ireland uh, is heard, and that we as a House could speak uh, and act uh, on that. I am delighted, however, at, uh, of late yesterday, the Minister, or on Sunday, the or yesterday, the Minister moved uh, from his original position uh, to a position that we uh, discussed in detail over the course of the last number uh, of months, and in particular uh, in the week uh, that has passed. What happened this week? Uh, to our young people, to 28,000 students, and in particular the 11,000 students and young people who have had their grades downgraded, was unforgivable. The system failed them incredibly. And after, I will shortly, and after months of uh, warning CCEA and the Minister in relation to the concerns that were shared with me, I was very frustrated to uh, see that the Minister was adamant, as was the Chief Executive of SIA, to continue, uh, quite determinedly so, uh, with the line that they were going on, which absolutely has disadvantaged quite a number of young people. I want to, first of all, thank the various parties that did sign the recall petition. I think it's vitally important we're having this debate. And whilst somewhat uh, the debate has shifted, there are still serious issues that exist that need to be addressed. Because the reality of the situation we're in today is that young people here, the young people in our respective constituencies that we represent, have been let down and failed. And yes, I will acknowledge very strongly and welcome the Minister's uh, move uh, in recent days on GCSE, first of all in the first half of the day and in the second half of the day in relation to A level, AS level. I just regret that this hadn't have happened sooner and that the concerns and worries of young people, of teachers, of academics across Northern Ireland and further afield that, that shared concerns about this were ignored. I myself, Mr Speaker, considerably raised concerns with the Minister and with SIA, as did others, and David Canning has been a huge support and help to me in relation to that. At a very early stage when exams were cancelled, we realised that there was going to be huge difficulties in trying to rule out this system, a system that has failed and confirmed our worst concerns. And the reality, the reality is that young people will pay the price for that. Minister, I am glad you have moved, but I regret that it took Boris Johnson or London to move first. And it really begs the question of this House, are we here as representatives, as public representatives for the people of the North of Ireland or Northern Ireland or whatever you want to call it? Are we here to represent them or are we to take our lead from London? Are we here to put first the best interests of our young people, of our teachers, or are we to follow the London, the British government in relation to their agenda? There's real serious questions about what has happened here. Uh, and, and I'll consciously say, yes, we're in a better position today than we were yesterday, but there's still huge damage that has been caused. Damage caused to the mental health of young people. Teachers have been offended and annoyed. I will give way to the member. Uh, to the member for giving way. The member is obviously a member of the Education Committee. Does he recall saying on the 22nd of April, and it's in Hansard, his description of the model that was put in place as a complex fix to what is a very difficult situation? If it was a fix on the 22nd of April, how can you stand on your feet and say you were warning about it for months? Thanks very much for your intervention. You'll also note, and it has been acknowledged by the Minister and indeed the Chief Executive of SIA, that I have raised considerable concerns in relation to it, and even throughout those entire a uh, few months that led up to the day that we're in today. Uh, I was told by the Chief Executive and the Minister that this is a work in progress, that they would get a model that they felt would and could work. 
The reality is, on information received just shortly after that date, it turned out that that wasn't going to be the case. And from that, I raised concerns over Zoom with Justin Edwards, the Chief Executive, and I realised at that stage that we were on a very slippery slope. The reality is, even with all the concerns that have been raised, the Minister and Justin Edwards, the Chief Executive of SIA, was determined to see this system out. To, to die in the ditch for a model that was untried and untested. To stand by an algorithm that no one has even seen. And that brings me to a fundamental point. I asked on Friday, as I have asked for months, for this formula, for this algorithm to be produced for checking. We're now sitting on Tuesday and the public have not yet got sight of it. Why is there a huge cloak of secrecy surrounding the processes of SIA? Because there are serious questions about the processes that then determine grades that haven't been checked Grades uh, that outflanked or, or uh, dismissed the judgment of teachers. And then I had to listen all week to Justin Edwards, the chief executive, say that teachers' judgment couldn't be trusted. But here we are from yesterday, the minister saying on GCSEs early yesterday morning, we can trust teachers' judgment when it comes to GCSEs. And then by four o'clock, we'll trust teachers' judgment in terms of A level and AS level now as well. How our teachers have been treated in this is intolerable and it's unacceptable. This House needs to do what's right for the people that we represent, not follow London. Have we learnt nothing from the chaos of Brexit or this government? It's vitally important that at all times we put the interests of the people we represent first. And it brings me to a very important point. Minister, whenever it comes to addressing this House, Mr Speaker, I want the Minister to tell us if he's going to produce the formula and the algorithm to the public to be checked, because that is what has actually caused the situation to begin with. A situation that downgraded students from a grade C to a U, and then at seven o'clock the night before the results were released to young people, they were told it's an anomaly. Young people are not anomalies. Their futures cannot be hung in the balance of an algorithm that hasn't been tried or tested. And our minister stood firmly, even on Friday, defending this system. But here we are today. And yes, I will say it again, I welcome it. Our young people are relieved. They're happy that we're in this situation. But the reality is, when it comes to university places, Mr. Speaker, quite a huge number of our young people are now sitting that have been rejected from university places. Again, on Friday, the minister told me in the Education Committee that young people he was assured by UCAS would not use university places. That was incorrect. I wasn't sooner two minutes out of the chamber to a whole spate of emails told me otherwise. So who is advising the minister in relation to this? Because he's severely off track. And I, I welcome also the minister's apology that has been given publicly to uh, teachers and to young people as well. But minister, we need to go further. We need to guarantee as an executive that our young people will get the places they should have got, not suffer at the hands of a system that failed them. A system that let them down and a system defended by you, Minister, uh, and by Justin Edwards as well as the Chief Executive. I will indeed. Does the member agree with me uh, that the last week has caused significant stress and anxiety for our students right across Northern Ireland that will undoubtedly have a detrimental impact on their wellbeing? And would he also agree with me that it is vital that we give them extra resources uh, during this challenging time? I thank the member for her intervention. Yes, young people have suffered incredibly. We have heard GPs and the mental health champion come out and say about the impact on the mental health of our young people. That is an unforgivable situation, Minister. And an apology won't suffice, but action will. Moving now to rectify these issues and ensuring university places for our young people is what's key in all of this. And transparency around the processes, Minister, uh, of, as to how these determinations were reached that outflanked that of the judgment of teachers as well. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I, I put the motion and the amendment to the House. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's nice to see you in the chair. It's also nice for me to be here after isolation as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as, as already alluded to many times in this chamber, we are in unprecedented times and have been forced into making unprecedented decisions none more so than the, th those that affect our economy, our health system, and most importantly, our education system. In an ideal world, young people would have been able to sit their examinations as normal. However, we are not in an ideal world. 
and the recent method of grading examination results has left many young people anxious, distressed, angry, and feelings replicated by both parents and teachers alike. Therefore, I congratulate the Minister and his staff for their efforts over the past few days. It was a case of you can't do right for doing wrong, and I am pleased that the Minister has listened to the concerns outlined by students and teachers throughout Northern Ireland. There was never going to be a perfect solution, and despite the stress that exams bring, I am sure that our young people would have preferred to sit their exams, but for this year, that was never going to be the case. There is no doubt that we are in very unusual times, and hopefully we will never have a year like this again. Like the rest of you, I have been contacted by parents, students, teachers, all outlining their concerns about the awarding of A and AS level grades this year. It is only fair that these students are to be treated the same as GCSE pupils and awarded the predicted grades from their teachers, and I believe that the Minister's decision to revert to the predicted grades is the correct one. I have every faith in our teachers. They have been working hard with their students to prepare them for exams for the past two years, if not longer. They know their strengths and what is achievable. I have no doubt that the prediction of grades was a difficult process for our teaching staff. They did not make these decisions easily. And I think we should thank our teachers for all their hard work preparing their students. At the outset, it was clear that Minister Weir did not want our young people to be disadvantaged, and I think that this needs to be highlighted. Minister Weir's announcement brings Northern Ireland in line with the rest of the UK, and most importantly, means that our young people will not be disadvantaged. I know that the past few days has caused huge distress to thousands of young people. For many, their plans have been scrapped. For others, they have had to rethink their futures. We are in very difficult times, and we hope that this won't be, this, we will not be placed in a scenario like this ever again. However, I will reach out to these young people and ask them to be patient. In closing my remarks, Mr Speaker, I would ask the Minister and his officials to also look at those pupils who are content with their grades, to ensure that this new method of grading will not disadvantage them in any way, and to set up urgent dialogue with universities to ensure there are places available and that appropriate finances are also available for those students who wish to attend university here in Northern Ireland, the mainland, Europe, or indeed the Republic of Ireland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Gormagat, it's good to see you back. Um, I speak in support of the motion and the amendment. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the deep upset, the distress, the frustration and the anxiety which has, been, which has burdened thousands of our young people over the course of the last week. This time of year is usually a difficult enough for many, but the way in which this debacle has played out in the context of truly exceptional circumstances has compounded the distress and upset of these young people. Young people have sacrificed an awful, an awful lot throughout the course of this global health pandemic, and, that's, and it's important that we recognise that. The very least they deserve in the absence of the usual exam process was a system that was fair and transparent, a system that recognised their hard work, their ability and their potential within the subjects that they had elected to take. Unfortunately and unacceptably, students were failed in this regard. I, like all our members in, in this House, have had numerous phone calls and contacts over the last week from distraught students, from concerned parents and from frustrated principals and teachers. There was understandable and warranted shock and disappointment at how the process, which was designed to standardise results, could downgrade over 11,000 A-level grades, completely throwing the professional judgments of our teachers to one side. I find it impossible myself to comprehend that those teachers who had spent years working with young people, who had built relationships with these young people, who are best placed to understand their strengths and weaknesses, their potential and their overall ability, would have their professional judgment disregarded to allow an untried and untested computer algorithm to cast the final assertion on their results of AS and A-levels. Yep. Call her colleague who's sitting on the back bench, Catherine Kelly, saying, in, in relation to teachers, I believe you need to be very careful about this. How will teachers ascertain grades when there is little to no evidence of continual assessment? That was in the Education Committee on the 22nd of April. Uh, <laughs> Thank the member for his comments. Uh, 
The Minister and SIA were all about protecting the system and disregarding the needs of the young people. I would argue that if we trusted teachers more, this process will level out and we will find the true ability of our young people, which not, is not always reflected in, in the, the pressurised testing. Over the last number of months, we have constantly heard about the new normal. Let's be adventurous and yet let's use this time to explore the new normal in education and put our children and young people first and foremost, not an outdated exam system. I could accept the argument made around the anomalies if, the, if this was an isolated incident. The fact is, Minister, drastic, drastic examples of downgraded were replicated right across schools across the north. This pointed to a flawed, unfit, and unfair and unreliable system, system, and our students deserved far better. And I sincerely hope that lessons will be learned by this from the Minister, his department and SIA. I welcome that the Minister recognised the need to overall his, uh, overhaul his approach. And I, and I also welcome his apology to the young people. But Minister, everyone else was way ahead on this issue. All our parties had demonstrated a willingness to work together in order to reach a workable solution that worked for our young people, one that respected our teachers. The motion agreed by the Education Committee last week and the motion we are debating today is testament to that. One of the most frustrating aspects of this whole episode is that many of us raise concerns with both the Minister and SIA. This could have been avoided if the Minister hadn't followed the Tories and waited on England to lead. The Minister needs to take a stark lesson from this. You are in a devolved, standalone assembly that has its own mandate and powers. Use that mandate and powers for the betterment of all the young people here in the North. While we head into 2021 academic year, I am fearful that all the lessons of this year have not been heard and taken on board. As a mother of a daughter who is entering year 12 next week, I worry that her year and the year 14 could be severely disenfranchised. These young people have lost four months learning and teaching right in the middle of a two-year course for GCSEs and A-levels. I would urge the Minister to look urgently at the curriculum for these courses and ensure that these young people are not left in the same situation next year. The focus now needs to be on clear and concise guidance for principals, teachers, pupils and parents. The Minister needs to reassure us all that this mis mishandling of the exams fiasco will not follow him into restart. Let's not allow the chaos of this exams debacle to define our, the restart of our education system. Thank you. Thank you, Igor Magan, and I call Robbie Butler. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome you back after uh, the long break. And also, would just want to pass on my regards at this uh, time to the SDLP. It's been a hard time over this past year. Not only did they lose John Hume recently, but also John Dallet and Seamus Mallon. So. There's been a, a great loss to, to the SDLP family. Um, I, I want to first of all acknowledge the, the voices that have been mobilised um, over this past four or five days. There have been many and they have been loud. Each of us, regardless of the party that we're in, will have been inundated by emails, by text messages, by Facebook messages, by phone calls at all hours of the day and night. The voices that were raised were from students, they were from parents, they were from carers. They were from teachers, they were from other professionals, and they were also from student advocate bodies. And they all agreed that something needed to be done because something just wasn't right. And we are in absolutely unique uh, times, unique circumstances, and there's no doubt that we needed a unique response to the problem. Um, the U-turn by the Minister on the GCSE and A-level awards and the decision to award students the best of the teacher predicted or CCEA award is one that everybody, one should, everybody here should be rightly grateful for. It will bring great comfort uh, to the students, the families, and certainly give some hope uh, to uh, those students. I do wish that it had have come sooner. The work of the committee in this, I have to be honest, uh, there, there was only a little bit of flag planting by, by some over this issue. I, I thought it was it was collegiately one of the best things that I've been involved with uh, as, as an MLA. Uh, there was some flag planting, but not too much. And um, uh, I want to thank the work of my colleagues on the committee for how robustly we worked on that together. Um, and I thought that was uh, remarkably good and perhaps gives some hope to the people of Northern Ireland that when we come together, 
we can achieve much. But when we look at uh, what happened last week, what those young people were faced with, when they got the results on Thursday, there were some who received uh, emails from universities rejecting their, their, their places, which must have been doubled down on their pain. And that was coupled to what already exists, and that is uh, anxiety related to getting your exam results. And many of us, and some of us, um, it was some time ago, but that is a real pressure for young people, probably worse than when any of us went to school. And that is uh, picked up in the high levels of mental ill health in Northern Ireland. And we know because of the, the, the information and data that we've got that adverse childhood experiences and trauma is what informs us now to how we're going to beat mental health. And as has already been picked out, there are 11,000 grades that are going to need to be changed. And I would charge CCA with carrying on with that work post haste to make sure that the universities and those further education colleges are able to allocate the places uh, fairly. But what I'm going to do in this next couple of minutes, I'm going to give a couple of examples, if that's OK. Um, I'm going to give one example, and I've heard this one many times, but this is, this is one that came to me. A young female student who lives in Lagan Valley, A-level predictions, four straight A's. An A, an a grade pupil, a high-achieving pupil. And she got one A, two B's, and a C. And we know that that is going to be fixed. The potential loss to her was a, a place in, in Queen's studying law. But I, I do believe that, you know, we maybe we could catch a tail on that. And we should. And some lost this. But this one is more stark. And please listen to this one. And I've got permission to share this without giving a name. A student who was awarded a U, an E, and a D. The target grade wasn't A's. It wasn't B's. It was C's and D's. Now, this young man had a mother who was severely mentally ill, who was assessed many years ago as not being capable of looking after her family. This young man's problems were compounded by the fact that his dad was violent and had a temper. And this young man, on his fifth attempt to run away from home, was successfully picked up within his own family and was a looked after child. And that bit's important, a looked after child, one of our most vulnerable. And I know one of the minister's um, uh, priorities is to look at uh, uh, educational underachievement. But this is an example right here. This young man only really wants to get his predicted grades of two C's and a D. And what compounded his problem is that the granny that took him in on her deathbed, literally at the start of this year, he made a promise to her that he would go to university. That was his promise to her. He wants to go to university. He doesn't want to be a doctor. He doesn't want to be a lawyer. He doesn't want to be a teacher. He wants to be the best that he can be. And that's what we want our young people to be, the best that they can be, regardless of what that is. We need to do a re-evaluation of our values. We need to make sure that that young man gets the opportunity that he deserves, and every student that has been caught in this indeed gets their opportunity. Um, and I, I know that mental health will get picked up, um, and I'll just leave it there because I'm sure some of my colleagues will pick that up. Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, the member. Uh, and I call now Chris Little. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't hear your microphone on. <laughs> okay. I don't. Okay, to proceed. It's on now. Okay. Yeah, the light wasn't on. Thank you. Perhaps that's good. Thank, thank the children and young people of Northern Ireland for the, the sacrifice uh, and the contribution that they've made to limiting the impact of COVID in our community and indeed to, to saving lives. I, I welcome the Minister's change of position on the awarding of grades on their behalf. I'm delighted for the pupils, parents and teachers who've worked for this outcome, and I, I welcome the Minister's apologies for the distress that they have experienced. However, there are concerns. It is concerning that the Minister could oversee an approach that produced such seriously flawed results for so many. Uh, in one school department, further to the SEA calculated grades, the percentage of pupils attaining A star to C grades reduced from 90 per cent to 60 per cent. 20 of 126 pupils did not gain a university place, and one pupil rank ordered by the school as second in the B band was awarded a D grade by SEA, and a pupil rank ordered 21st in the B band by the school was awarded a B grade by SEA. Startling inconsistencies, Mr. Speaker. It's also seriously concerning that a pattern is emerging of a minister consistently following a Conservative government rather than leading for the people of Northern Ireland. 
a Conservative government that has adopted a slow, inadequate and flawed response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I sat in this assembly on Wednesday, the 25th of March, as chair of the Education Committee, calling on the Education Minister to set a date for the planned closure of schools to be told, no, now is not the time to close schools. Only for Boris Johnson to announce a closure of schools that same afternoon and the Minister of Education to immediately follow suit. I sat in the same place last Friday and put to the Education Minister that the only fair option was for him to award all pupils, with whichever is highest of their AS level, teacher assessed or SEA calculated grade for GCSE and A level. And I note, no, I'm not giving away. And I, I note, I note, I note that that is not exactly what the minister has announced. And I would seek clarification on that. Order now, member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would seek clarification uh, on that. Yeah, I'm ha happy to give way if you want to clarify, Minister. Yeah, no, to clarify in terms of, I suppose specifically the members referring to the AS grade uh, situation, uh, there is, uh, it is not, it is the issue that it will be the, the higher of the two. And there are two reasons for that. The AS grade is based around 40% of the work, whereas the other two grades represent the full two years experience. But we've also now reached a point at which everyone throughout the United Kingdom, uh, where there is going to be complete competition, is now on exactly the same position. Whereas if we were to, and indeed Wales that have, I think previously made reference to the AS grade, have now dropped that as an issue, and everybody is on the position that it's the higher of the two. So I think it would disadvantage our pupils if we were to muddy the waters by introducing that. Thank the Minister for Member the has an minute. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker, and obviously the Minister has more time to go into that in a bit more detail as well. Um, there is also a concerning patter, a pattern of failing to heed contributions of the Education Committee and indeed the education profession. This Assembly and the Education Committee consistently questioned the approach on this matter and particularly key aspects of it that failed so many people so badly, particularly the rank ordering approach that I have referred to and the issue of past school performance. The Minister was questioned about why the rescheduling of exams was dismissed and rank ordering was used at the ad hoc committee at which he announced the cancellation of exams on April 16. And the Education Committee held a number of sessions on these matters. We were absolutely clear that grades must be awarded on the basis of individual ability. And perhaps for uh, Christopher Stolford, I will refer to some of that. The Education Committee wrote to say on the 3rd of June, emphasising that fair, sorry, wrote to say, yeah, on the 3rd of June, emphasising that fairness and transparency must be key to this approach. Expressed considerable concern in respect of the statistical model which was to be used to inform the awarding of grades. Uh, that had yet to be fully developed or subject to any testing, and that its characteristics and method of application had yet to be explained and communicated to schools, including how the SEA model would link to similar models across the UK. The committee clearly indicated that an examination and appeals process should allow for individual variation, and that professional teacher assessment would be a reliable basis on which to proceed. Indeed, it also said that appeals should be based on uh, the characteristics and application of the statistical model, something the Minister only introduced last week. So we responded robustly. I hope the Minister will engage with the Committee uh, on this matter, because there are urgent clarifications needed, particularly in terms of timescale for grade allocations to pupils and colleges and universities, and in particular to how he will work with the Minister of Economy to ensure those institutions have all the support they need to honour the offers that they have made to pupils across Northern Ireland. We can't see this be repeated next year, so we need urgent clarity on what the curriculum and assessment process will look like next year, and that includes what contingency plan will be in place for post-primary admissions 2021. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Okay, thank you. And I now, now call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, like others, I welcome you back to, to, the, to the Chair. I want, in my opening remarks, uh, Mr Speaker, to pay tribute to the pupils and the students of Northern Ireland, to pay tribute to the teaching professionals of Northern Ireland, and indeed to recognise that our educational system is second to none, however you measure it, across the world. And indeed that it provides opportunities uh, for progress, provides opportunities for those with ambition, and indeed supports those 
who need support. And that's been the characteristic of what the minister has tried to do in his tenure uh, in office. I will give way, Mr Speaker. I appreciate the member giving way because Mr Little was so reluctant to. Does the member recall Mr Little saying, and it's on the hand side of this House, I think it's safe to say we, along with students, teachers, schools and parents, welcomed the clarity provided by the minister last week on the question of examinations. There it is in the record. Member has an extra minute. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and it's, it's in that theme, also, maybe, Mr. Speaker. And the, the, the last Friday's uh, meeting of the committee uh, on this matter was a telling situation in terms of the politics of the meeting, not the issue in the meeting, but the politics right. of the meeting. Uh, what we had, Mr. Speaker, was the minister subjecting himself to a grilling, and commendably. Uh, to be commended for his performance at that meeting. But then we had Sia sitting outside the door, and we were about to interview Sia, two members of Sia, when the, the, the chair didn't want to divide the committee, but he wanted to take a vote before, before the committee listened to what Sia had to say, before they had to listen. Mr. Speaker, the one thing that has characterised Peter Weir's tenure in office is his ability, to, his interest, his willingness, his uh, giving of himself to attend the committees. He has been unstinting in that. And then often, I, I have to say, I have wondered why he has done it, considering what has happened at some of the committees. And Minister Weir, what has characterised his, his, his uh, ambitions for this uh, assembly and for our educational system, he's recognised that there are many children, and it's already been paid tribute to, that he's recognised that many young people don't get the opportunities that they deserve. And he has taken action on it. He also acknowledges that there are many young people who do well, and he wants to support them so that they do even better. Minister Weir has made no comment about the campaign across the, 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 the Northern Ireland or across the UK. All he did was take action to make sure that Northern Ireland students were not disadvantaged within the UK. And we all want, we all want the very best educational system. We all want the best opportunities and the best qualifications and the best skill sets for our children, for our pupils, for our students. And indeed, that has characterised uh, Minister Weir's tenure. We want the very best examination results. We want students to be tested against the best. We want them because we know, Mr Speaker, we know that Northern Ireland students do extremely well. And they've done extremely well this year. They do extremely well in the past, and I have no doubt that they will do extremely well in the future. They compare, their abilities compare very favourably against any, any other uh, set, set of pupils. Minister Weir has given his attendance uh, at the committee unstintingly, as I've said. But we need to move on, Mr Speaker. We need to move on to where we go next. And I've, I have to say, I welcome, I, welcome two, I welcome two comments made. One in the Belfast Telegraph today, by Mr. Alan Hutchinson, a principal, I believe, of Glastry College, who in commenting on Mr. Weir has said, I think it's only proper that recognition is given to the Minister for Education, Mr. Peter Weir, for doing the right thing. I appreciate that he was under considerable pressure to change his position on the grading system employed by SIA. And in such circumstances, change requires great courage. That's followed by another uh, educational professional uh, who, who tweeted that it's a sign of strength and leadership to be able to reverse such a decision. And I acknowledge and admire the minister, and I am grateful. Integrity is about doing the right thing, no matter how hard it is. This decision shows integrity and leadership. Mr. Speaker, there are those who have criticised the minister uh, in this debate, who have made remarks such as, uh, and I refer to Ms Mullen, Deputy Chair of the Committee, 
She called it a debacle. She said the students were failed. Students deserved far better. And our students deserve the very best. But there are other people, Mr. Speaker, in society who also deserve the very best. And a judge made a decision on that yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I now call Catherine Kelly. Good, Ken Coelia. At the heart of the past few days has been the future of a generation of young people unfortunate enough to be coming of age during a pandemic. A future that it appears the British Tory government and the DUP were prepared to wantonly discard. I can understand a privately educated privileged elite such as the British Cabinet having no regard for the hopes and aspirations of ordinary young people, but the DUP needs to open their eyes and start representing the people who vote for them. Peter Weir waited until a British minister in London gave way on the issue. Why? Why are children in the north of Ireland held ransom by decisions taken in England? Almost as soon as the results were known, first in Scotland and then other jurisdictions, it was clear that something had gone very, very wrong. The education system is supposed to deliver equality of opportunity. Last week, it delivered postcode discrimination. Let's put on record what the British government and the DUP were prepared to preside over. More than a third of results downgraded by algorithm. Pupils studying in large schools located in disadvantaged areas most harshly treated. Pupils from our black, Asian and minority ethnic communities were likely to be more disadvantaged. Pupils with disabilities faring less favourably. In the end, it was political pressure, not conscience, that moved the British government and the DUP. Sorry is not enough. The damage has already been done. Places have already been lost in universities and colleges. Young lives have already been disrupted. A month that should have been filled with celebrations and preparation will forevermore be remembered as an anxious and distressing time. A month that should have been filled with excitement for the future replaced with uncertainty and confusion. I'm calling on DUP ministers Peter Weir and Diane Dodds to work together to ensure that all of the young people who lost out when they were denied proper grades last week are helped to find a university or college place to meet their needs. The British government should play their part by removing the cap they've imposed on university places this year. We've already seen young people take to the streets to express their anger and demand their right to be treated fairly. Get them the places and the future that they deserve. Okay, thank you. And uh, I call Christopher Stalford. Mr. Speaker, uh, firstly, I welcome you back to your place. I rise and declare an interest in this matter as I have a niece who received her A level results last week. I think it's important that all members consider how it is that we came to this pass. We're in this position because we are in the middle of a global public health crisis. A little over five months ago, the executive decided that schools should close. The decision was also taken to put vast swathes of our economy into deep freeze until the crisis passed. The young people affected by these decisions will be paying in their taxes for those decisions for a very, very long time. It's therefore vital that they are in the best possible position to attract and secure the best possible jobs and establish the best possible careers for themselves going forward. Because for the better that our young people do, then the better all of Northern Ireland society will do. Nobody could have foreseen the circumstances that are confronting us today. COVID has impacted upon almost every aspect of every person's life in this country. And our young people undertaking GCSE and A-level and AS-level examinations have been hit particularly, particularly hard. I think it's also worth putting on the record of this House the extremely difficult situation facing students in fourth form or lower sixth as they are going into a new school year. They will have to overcome significant challenges brought about by a loss of so much classroom learning time. It's in this context that we meet today. People should always remember that we're living in unprecedented times. Formal school examinations were not stopped for the duration of World War II. They weren't stopped for the three-day week. They didn't stop for the winter of discontent or for the miners' strike. That should give us a sense of the scale of the challenge that we are tasked with dealing with. In order to allow people to progress in their edu educational careers, 
a model of awarding qualifications that did not involve sitting formal examinations was going to be necessary because of the decisions taken to combat COVID. That, I assume, was accepted by everyone. Had the minister, for example, suggested reopening schools to allow for the sitting of exams, I assume that there would have been widespread opposition in this House to such an idea. I'm happy to give way to any member who wishes to contradict me, although I would urge the Chair of the Education Committee, who has been here longer than I, to cease chuntering from a sedentary position. It is not very becoming. No model would ever have been without its flaws, and any member pretending that they had the answer all along is engaging in a fantasy. The model that was in place had significant drawbacks, as does this one, grade inflation being the most obvious. Ministers right to respond to the concerns expressed, and I am pleased that no student from Northern Ireland will be placed at an unfair disadvantage in relation to their peers elsewhere in these islands. I also welcome the announcement that has been made by the Economy Minister in relation to the securing of additional university places. And I urge all colleagues in the Northern Ireland Executive to get behind her and to give her the support that she needs to secure the funding for those additional places. Sir, these are unprecedented times. Problems with one system have been identified and a new system has been put in place. Concerns first raised on a Thursday were addressed by the Minister on the Monday. I think that that's reasonable and proportionate, and I think that the Minister, no one should ever doubt his commitment to ensuring every young person in Northern Ireland, whether they're a primary school, secondary school, uh, or going on uh, to a university education, that every young person in Northern Ireland should get the best start in life. Ms Kelly referred to people from a working class background. I'm from a working class background. I was born in Annadale Flats and reared in the bottom of the Ravenhill Road. The best start in life that I had was an education at Wellington College Belfast. I'm very proud of my roots and I was sent here to represent working class communities and I assure her I would never want or wish to preside over a situation where such communities were treated unfairly or disadvantaged. And by his actions that he has undertaken, the Minister has ensured that all students regardless of their background, are not placed at an unfair... Yes, I will, Ms Woods. Given way, but will the member agree with me that COVID has exacerbated already existing disadvantages in the system, given that just over half of pupils in non-grammar schools scored at least five GCSEs A star to C, and in comparison to grammar schools, where it was nearly 95 per cent? I absolutely member do has an extra minute. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I absolutely do accept that, because people from the sort of background that I came from their parents couldn't pay for tutors. My parents couldn't pay for tutors. They couldn't pay for supplements to their education beyond the classroom learning experience, which I had. So, no, I absolutely accept that, and that is something that needs to be addressed going forward, because every child, regardless of whether, in, in, in my constituency, whether they're born in the market or the Malone Road, every child should be given the op absolute ample opportunity to make the best start in life. And I know that the minister is committed to that. We're all of us. I I've got... 20 seconds. We're all of us trying to feel our way through the biggest national emergency that we have faced in a generation. We should be doing so with a view to securing the best outcomes for young people, not securing headlines on radio shows. I thank the member and I call Kiva Archibald. and um, I'd like to welcome you back um, to your position also. Over the past number of months, um, we've all used the words unprecedented and extraordinary an awful lot, and Mr Stelford has made the point in his uh, speech by using them several times. Um, and while obviously the pandemic and crisis in the health system and in our economy and society are unprecedented in modern times, we've had to try and deal with these things and the outworking of them as best as possible. But for this particular scenario, in relation to the awarding of grades, and there was a precedent there from the week before in Scotland. Instead of being proactive, of learning from the mistakes that were made elsewhere and taking an approach that was based on the well-being of our young people, the Minister stuck with a position that seems to have been much more about protecting the system. This should have never been about defending an algorithm. It should have been about the well-being of our young people and giving them clarity and confidence in their grades. Instead, we've had almost a week of additional stress and anxiety for young people, their families, their teachers, and that will now be further compounded 
with additional delays and uncertainty around universities' admissions. Instead of taking a decision a week ago when it was clear from the Scottish example that we would face the same issues, the Minister dragged his feet and seems to have waited on the English Minister adopting a position before doing similar. Of course, it's not the first time in this crisis the Minister has slavishly followed the lead of London rather than doing the right thing for citizens here. The reality now unfolding is that there may be several hundred more students who, on the basis of this amended approach, obtain their conditional offers at universities. And while that will definitely be a positive thing for those young people, our universities and colleges are unclear about what the implications will be for them. Universities normally have almost a week to prepare their admissions and are now in a position where they don't have the students' grades and are, of course, receiving calls from students and their parents inquiring about places. I hope it will speedily be communicated uh, to both the universities and the young people about the new amended grades, and I hope the Minister could perhaps clarify the timeline around that. Happy for the, uh, the, for the member to give way in relation to that. The position is that schools, and a number of schools, for instance, today are already in the position that they can indicate to uh, young people, indeed, a number of schools have made representations and made themselves available to make that known to young people. Directly speaking with regards to universities, the process is, and this morning, although I, I don't believe it had concluded whenever uh, this meeting started, that UCAS had convened all the awarding bodies and indeed the regulators to ensure that all information, legally I think all information has got to go to UCAS. Uh, I understand the intention was to ensure that that happened uh, within the next couple of days, that everybody would have, but uh, CCA and others have to directly give that to UCAS, who will then forward that on to all uh, universities, so that the position will be uniform for all students uh, within the university system. Member has an extra minute. Thank you, and I, I thank the Minister for clarifying that, and hopefully there will be a statement in, in respect of that to, to give some clarity to universities and to the young people later today. Um, because we all know our universities have um, allocated maximum student numbers each year, and in a normal year, if they go over that number, they are fined. So yesterday, understandably, they were asking questions about what this would mean for them this year. Would they be able to take all of the students who obtain their conditional offer, and would they be funded for this? What about the impacts on courses that have quotas like medicine and nursing? What, what will the impact be on the intake for next year if the, the, those courses are filled up this year? Had, did the Education Minister consult with executive colleagues around all of that? Did, in particular, the Economy Minister about what this decision would mean and how they would deal with it and, more importantly, communicate it? What about the Health Minister? Did he talk to him about the, the courses like medicine, net, dentistry, nursing? And what about teaching places? Have all of those things been, been considered in, in taking this decision? Because for every action... Go ahead. Thank, thank you, and thank the member for giving way. Uh, you, you rightly made reference to the Minister for the Economy and the Minister for Health having an important part to play as we move forward. Would, would it be right to expect a collegiate approach from the executive, from a Sinn Féin perspective at least, to address these issues? Gary Melgit, and um, I'm coming to that. So, um, for every decision, obviously, there are consequences, but instead of planning and having the answers to these questions, we are now faced with further delay and distress. And so I do very much welcome the fact that the Finance Minister has this morning said that he will work with executive colleagues to identify those additional resources that may be necessary to deal with the outworkings of this decision. Gary I thank the member, and I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and you're very welcome back uh, to the House. I rise to support the amendment. I concur with the sentiments, passion and dogged determination expressed earlier by my colleague uh, Daniel McCrossan and indeed with other members right across this House. Um, there is no doubt we have done our young people a great disservice. We must learn from our mistakes. If you see a train coming down the track, it's best to get out of the way. The First Minister of Scotland set the precedent but we didn't follow. I wish to com concentrate my comments on the issue of maximum student numbers. Northern Ireland has a very unique educational disadvantage across the four UK nations, and that is the Mazen cap. This cap on student numbers holds back our economy by depriving our economy of the skills that we need. It has been a noose around the neck of our economy for years. 
This situation damages our productivity as well as our decision making, but it also adds momentum to the Northern Ireland diaspora, breaking up families as children leave home to study in Great Britain, typically to never return. As a mother, I have seen my daughters leave Northern Ireland to study, and indeed they're both away at the moment. And that is fine, but when the student wants to stay at home and is not able to stay at home. We are forcing them away and because we don't have enough university places. This splits up families and is heartbreaking. And as from the report of the OECD just concluded a few days ago, it is not providing the next generation of graduate talent that our economy needs for the future. Nor are we doing enough for those students who do not go to university, who need high quality apprenticeships and a future in well paid, emotionally rewarding work. But today is about the ongoing failure around the Mazen cap that has become a crisis. That is because the farce around. I will go ahead. Thank the member for giving way briefly. Absolutely agree that the maximum student numbers does need to be adjusted in, in these particular circumstances. Uh, but does the member acknowledge that abolishing the Mazen cap would require significant uh, funding implications and that any assistance that is provided to third level education must be based um, on additional resources and not increased student fees? Member has an extra minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the member. Yes, I agree that we need to restructure um, our education and skills provision within, uh, within Northern Ireland because the current uh, system as it stands is inadequate. That is because the farce around A-level grades has forced our two universities to breach the Madison cap imposed by them by the Department for the Economy. Last week, they offered places which they were bound to honour to students uh, with the required minimum grades. But this week, they are also bound to honour previous conditional offers to students who, with the revised grade, now meet those conditions. This mess is not of the university's making yet it potentially creates a very serious financial situation for the universities. And it is not a one-year problem. The universities will be breaching the Madison cap this year and perhaps for the next three or four years for some courses uh, because of the length of the undergraduate programmes. Are we really expecting the universities to pick up the financial cost of this A-level fiasco? Yesterday, the British media reported that the Education Secretary for England, Gavin Williamson, had promised the UK universities would be released from the student number cap to allow students with sufficient A-level grades to be accepted. That is no doubt a misreport because the British media doesn't understand the difference between the UK and Great Britain. But it does allow us to consider an important point. This mess is not entirely of the making of Peter Weir or the Department of Education and CCEA, it is also the mess of the British government. So to, the answer is clear. We must lift the Mazen cap for Northern Ireland, allowing students with sufficient grades to study at university in Northern Ireland. We must not expect the two universities here to pick up the bill for that. And given the role of the UK government, we expect the education economy and finance ministers here to very robustly make the case to the UK government that it should pick up the bill for this. One final point. As a foil MLA, I urge Ulster University to allocate an additional Mazen it gets to the McGee campus. It remains a scandal that Northern Ireland's second city does not have a full-sized university campus. The SDLP will not rest until this is achieved. And that is a pledge that we make in the memory of John Hume. The Minister for the Economy and the Executive have an opportunity today not just to deal with this latest result of what COVID has done to our society. We also have an opportunity to reset the future, providing a better future for our children's generation. Let us not allow this prize to slip from our grasp. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I welcome you back also. Having listened to the debate in this chamber this afternoon, it is now paramount that we move forward to try and mitigate against any fallout there has been 
from the issuing of the so-called results using an unseen algorithm last Thursday. An unseen algorithm that obviously had not been trialled previously. Yes, receiving results of any kind is particularly stressing, but receiving results that our future careers depend upon, even more so. Our young people this year, along with their parents and teachers, have had a particularly stressful time since the abrupt ending of the school year and the worries of lockdown on their education to now deal with another stressful situation. Last Thursday brought about nothing only disappointment for our young people, their parents and their hardworking teachers, particularly as the day advanced and they learned that they were awarded, that the result they were awarded had nothing, what, had nothing to do with the work that the teachers had done on teacher assessment in relation to their grades. No consideration had been given to the long and tedious task the teachers had in putting together evidence to support their predicted grades of each pupil. Yeah. Thank the member for giving way. Will the member agree with me that it is vitally important, given what has happened, that the Minister and SIA produced to the public the algorithm used that overrid the judgment of teachers? It is vitally important in the interest of transparency that that is the case. Would the member agree? Yes, I would, and I would like to have seen the algorithm. I think we need to see the algorithm. Sorry, to the, the member has an action minute. Sorry for that. Now a U-turn has, has taken place, and the teacher predicted grades accepted as an option towards the final grade. There must be a concerted effort to ensure that our A-level students are now not disadvantaged in any way further. Firstly, there must be an insurance that help will be available through our health service, our mental health agencies, to support those that have really suffered as a result of this fiasco and may continue to suffer. Secondly, these frustrated young people must be given the opportunity to accept their places on their original first course choices, whether it be in a further education college or at a university, and be permitted to start immediately. These students must not be asked to defer to next year. This situation is not of their making. I thank the member for giving way, and uh, I agree with you in terms of the need for the health minister to, to, to support where it's required. Would you also agree with me that as we move forward and as our young people take up places in the universities, that indeed the Minister for the Economy, Diane Dodds, will also need support, and that there should be a collegiate approach from the executive to address the issues? Yes, indeed, and uh, I would agree there must be a collegiate approach, and I'll be dealing with that in a few moments. With the larger numbers now having the opportunity to take up a university place, funding must immediately be sourced by the Minister of Economy and be put in place to resource the universities for not next year, but the next three to four years, the average length of a university course that many of these extra students will be allocated to. I am aware of some universities which have particularly popular courses such as medicine, who have already raised concerns about the lack of capacity, staffing, accommodation and facilities if numbers are increased, especially when they are also trying to ensure staff and students are kept safe as they reopen and need to continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. While most of the debate today has been around the A-level results, and rightly so, we must not forget about those still waiting to receive their BTEC grades to date. There has been no clarity on how these students will be affected. With universities filling up, there is a growing level of anxiety among these students. I appeal to you, Minister, to try and resolve this situation post-haste. We've got <laughs> Just, an extra minute already. In relation to the BTEC grades, I understand that part of the problem there has been with awarding bodies, uh, such as have been issues around Pearson and I think um, Cambridge. Uh, the regulations of uh, boards that are outside of Northern Ireland lie with the English regulators. So similarly as with A-levels, where they are awarded by a body that is outside Northern Ireland, it, it lies. We obviously will be making representations in relation to that, but that, in terms of the BTEC side of it, would lie outside any actual control that either myself 
or the economy minister would directly have in relation to that. So at, at best, we can act like, uh, like others to try and, and push the issue, but we don't have control over it. Minister, I thank you, I thank you for that clarification. And uh, can I just urge you and the Minister of Education, uh, Minister, Minister of Economy, to uh, get post haste to get going and make sure that there's no more damage done to our young people. Thank you. Okay, I thank the member, and I call John O'Dowd. Uh, August uh, Welcome back, uh, and also to the other members who have been isolating uh, over this last number of months. Um, I'm not going to rehearse the, all the events of this last week, nor am I here to bash the minister, because I have been there, done that, wore the T-shirt, and have a full head of grey hair as a result of it. So I know the burden the minister carries, I know the burden other minister carries, and I don't envy any of their roles at this time, because they are carrying additional burdens as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I think, by and large, our executive has responded well to that pandemic. So I'm not here to simply criticise, but I am here to challenge. It's the role of the, executive, or the Assembly, it's the role of the committees to hold our ministers and the executive to account. I just want to start off on, on one of the last points the minister made there in relation to the English awarding bodies and the Welsh awarding bodies. Uh, and this frustrated me when I was minister as well. I am of the view that any examination board plying their word here should be held to account by the minister here and by the accreditation bodies here. It is ridiculous that we have organisations selling exams to our schools, but yet there's little and in some cases no accountability over them. And this crisis has exposed that, I think, as a failing in the examination system. I would be of the view, a personal view, that we should have one examinations body which is accountable to our minister, our education committee and our assembly. And that's something I think we should look at uh, moving forward. Would yes. Would the member accept that there are a wide choice of subject areas and if we're going to provide examinations for all the possible subject areas, it'll be inordinarily expensive to manage and it's unpractical. Would you not accept that? Well, Scotland, no, seems, to has an Scotland seems to do very well on it. Uh, and that brings me on to a, a comment from Mr Newton. We do not have a world-class education system. We have world-class educators. I think our pupils have the potential to be world-class, given half a chance in the classroom and in the home. But we don't have a world-class education system. And that's not the fault of this minister or the previous minister or the minister before that. Because I think cause since uh, the power-sharing institutions have been established, we are starting to see an education system here develop and the challenges and support that the local executive can put in place are moving us forward incrementally and slowly at times, but we're moving forward uh, very, very quickly. Oh, well, I do want to support you in, this, uh, 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 in your comments. Uh, and isn't it always that we talk about the uh, charges, the cost of education, rather than talking about investment in, in education and the workings of investment in education? Okay, Th thank you for, for, your, for your comments. Um, I, I want to just touch on how you... The Minister and SIA put in a, a, a mechanism, which I accept, and there'll be quotes thrown back and forth, most people welcomed, uh, because it was seen as a solution to no exams. But you see, once that solution was seen to have failed, you then have to move to an alternative. And that's what concerns me about the Minister's response and SIA's response to this matter. Because this could have been resolved on Friday. The Education Committee uh, worked collectively on Friday, and there was some politicking, I accept there was some politicking outside the committee as well. Uh, but the Education Committee worked collectively on Friday to bring forward a solution. That could have been adopted. It could have been resolved on Saturday, on Sunday, uh, when my party was engaging with officials from, for, from the, the Minister's party. There could have been engagement, there could have been an enhancement of that engagement. But my concern is this. The minister, or people close to the minister, didn't see there was a problem until late Sunday night. And then went and acted on Monday morning in relation to GCSEs. When they should have realised at that stage there was only one solution left to them. And that was to move in relation to the A-levels as well. Now the minister has said that he, he, he didn't want to move, and I'm not directly quoting the minister at this stage, 
Uh, he didn't want to disadvantage our students in relation to England and Wales. But by failing to move at that stage, did he not disadvantage our students? Because he didn't give them an advantage. If the minister had have stepped forward and laid as our education minister, as the education minister of our schools, of our pupils, then he could have given our pupils an advantage. Whereas many of our students are now fighting for places in Scottish universities, Welsh universities and English universities, and indeed universities across the border, which are being filled up uh, by Scottish students, by Welsh students and English students now as well. So the minister, by not giving our students an advantage, actually was a disadvantage. But I want to move on now to what happens, has to happen next. Our minister's copybook is blotted. His leadership has been questioned. But what we now need to see in the days and weeks ahead is a decisive leadership because our schools are now facing a bigger challenge, reopening. And as a parent uh, and as elected representative, I want to ensure that we have a minister who's leading from the front, who is giving confidence to me as a parent, as an elected representative, to our school leaders, to our pupils, that those schools are opening safely and all measures that can be taken are being taken to ensure they open on a full-time basis and safely over the next weeks and months. Because that's where parents' minds are at now. Yes, university is important, but Minister, you are going now, you have an opportunity to step forward and give decisive leadership in relation to the opening of schools, and that is now what is needed from you and your department. Our time you. is up. Okay, thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's good to see you back in your chair. I know throughout this time, from the number of meetings that we've had through the business office, that you have been working quite hard. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity very quickly to also um, just to take a moment just to say to the SDLP, you lost a giant. Um, we all lost a giant, um, and I was thinking of you during that sad times and the sad times now. Um, Mr Speaker, on the 12th of August, um, which was the day before the A-level results came out, um, it was United Nations International Youth Day. And on that day, the, the United Nations said it was an opportunity to celebrate and mainstream young people's voices, actions and initiatives, as well as their meaningful, universal and equitable engagement. And can I just pay tribute at this stage to our young people across Northern Ireland? In what was a time that was extremely stressful for them and their parents, and I will declare an interest as a mummy who had an AS level student receiving grades last week, um, I, I would like to pay tribute for those young people because they, they were dignified in their response to what they were going through. And I will pay particular attention to the Secondary Students' Union Northern Ireland, the various students' unions across the area, and to the teachers' unions, because they all showed us that with a, a singular voice, they had strength. And I am glad, as, as Daniel McCrossan had said, that, that those concerns were heard and finally taken upon with, with the Minister and what has happened. But the job's not over yet. So I stand here in front of you today. I'm not going to talk about the good work of the Education Committee or any of the rest of the members here. I'm going to talk to you as a parent. And what I'm going to say is the job's not done yet because there are many, many questions that parents and students themselves need to have clarification on. And one of the ways forward out of this debacle would be to answer those. For example, Saying that SEA will get the grades out soon isn't good enough. We know a date that they will be received. When UCAS are going to receive those grades so we can finally find out what's going to happen to those young people who are moving forward into higher education. What communications has there been from Northern Ireland to UCAS to identify those students who will still lose out on a place because of the late changes to grades, because perhaps some places are filled? Um, we need to hear, and the amendment today does call on the whole executive, but we do need to hear from the Minister for the Economy um, what's happening with the money for university places. We cannot take away the cap on university places. We're potentially looking at an additional thousand students for the Queen's University and even probably the same number for the University of Ulster. Um, that could equate to £10 million per year for each of the year of that Going, additional £10 million per year for each year going forward for three or four years. I will indeed. Thank you very much indeed for the member giving way. For those of us who are committee chairs, we will have seen a letter that has come out from the Finance Committee or from the Finance Minister that looks at somewhere in the region of about 35 million may be available in year. So maybe, maybe all the political parties around here today can commit to using that money if we are looking for a collegiate cross-executive approach to be dealing with this problem with the university cap. Thank you. The member has an extra minute. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. And that is the collegiate approach that we need to pull Northern Ireland out of this. Absolutely. 35 million in year, 
is one year? Can we have it across all of the years? And so that doesn't impact children like my daughter and, and her cohort that are coming through with AS levels next year that may find that they don't have enough places available. Um, but I would say that to Minister Dodds, um, we know that she has been under extraordinary pressure because of the, the issues that we have with COVID. She cannot delay on this. Unlike the excluded in Northern Ireland, we cannot see any delays on this. I also turn then to the Minister for Communities because another issue has come forward from parents. Are there enough student housing places available around our universities for those students? Will landlords see this as an opportunity to raise even further rents that are already exorbitant? Um, we need to think about the wider implications of this and how it's going forward. If we're going to increase our university places, there are more things that we need to consider. What about student loans? Are they going to be able to cope with the additional amount of requests that are coming through? Um, mental health services. We have young people who have just completed their A2 who are not going back to school, who will not have that teacher support. Could I ask the minister if he will look at youth services to provide mental health support for those young people to ensure that this that they have gone through and this COVID awful thing that we are all going through is considered? The BTEC results have already been mentioned by Rosemary. You know, there are students there who need that. And I would encourage the Minister and the Minister for the Economy um, to, to get in touch with Pearson and those bodies to find out what is happening because we're leaving those students behind. I'm not going to mention the school restart because I know today the Education Committee will be de dealing with that and that is another huge job that has to happen. But what I would like to say in closing is while all this is going on, we have special education needs students who are still being ignored. We have the um, supported employment programme that is looking at closing down. Those young people have just left school too. And I wish this house and the public were as vexed about their futures as we are about A-level students. There are some of our students who need assistance. There are some of our students who need to know what their future are. And we cannot leave them behind. OK, thank you. And I call uh, Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's glad to see you two back in the chair. Uh, delighted uh, for that. Um, all of us have been inundated with the queries, the questions, the problems, the issues, the, the raw emotion by students and families that has been generated by the A level. Um, well, people call it a fiasco now. And I'm glad, and I have to compliment the Minister for realising that it was definitely going the wrong direction, because I've been contacted by schools who were facing into an absolute avalanche of appeals. And frankly, all you would have needed thrown into the middle of that, and the Minister will be well acquainted with this from his legal background, would be a JR or two. And that would have left us maybe at Christmas time still sitting and nothing resolved. So, Minister, thank you for uh, realising the situation we were in and making uh, the decision that you did make. And it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision for you, I have to say, Minister, uh, given, and I watched your, your performances at the committees and all last week, but it was doing what you need to do when faced with the reality of that situation. Um, I had a, a young mother in with me yesterday, very, very, very emotional, and this was about two o'clock yesterday, and I said, wait until four o'clock. Uh, to be seen today because there is an announcement been made in GB in England, more specifically, and that may have consequences for ourselves. So we are at this point now. However, it has created a lot of distress among young people, and we have to emphasise the point that university for young people is not the be-all and end-all. Um, many young people will go on to have very successful careers, and I know many of them who have never gone near university but they've gone on and adapted and moved to very successful careers. Not academic careers, but very, very successful ones. And many of those are, are within my own constituents in the field of manufacturing and being absolutely creative with the skills that they have been gifted with. Uh, however, the message that I'm still receiving is that this could have been done much, much better. Um, the, sco uh, the schools... Um, the, the school principals that I've been uh, tick-tacking with along this have been trying to manage this emotional and indeed professional roller coaster. Um, the, 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 some of the schools are deeply resentful that they, in fact, that what they did do was one principal wrote to me 
This year, CCEA requested centre assessed grades and detailed guidance be provided and how this was to be carried out. Staff took a minimum of two weeks to complete this exercise. There were several Zoom meetings and moderation meetings to reach the decisions. Then the provisional grades were sent to principals. Further deliberation took place before the grades were finalised and the data entered into the new system set up by CCEA. Each principal had to sign off on every subject. I keep asking myself in what other profession would the decision taken by the person who is most qualified to make it be totally disregarded. That's from one principal. Another principal, uh, again, was referencing the little consideration given to teacher predicted grades, and I'll not go over that again. The, um, the no consideration being given to pupil performance and improvement, uh, especially with pupils taking resets, and there's always a significant percentage difference between AS and A2 within that specific school. That factor doesn't seem to have been considered. Yeah, sure, uh, Minister. Just on a, a point of accuracy in relation to that, in terms of resets, where resets had been planned, that is part of the formula which was taken into account as regards the A level side, where there was a reset in terms of AS level. And that's not simply those that took place as a reset, but those were planned because there's a recognition that where there is resets, there is generally speaking um, differs from subject to subject, that will be factored in within each subject, that there will be some level of rise in the results as a result of a reset. That, that was part of the formula which is applied as regards A levels. Member yeah. has an extra minute. I, I thank the Minister for that. And uh, another point raised by uh, a princ the presiding principal was in English examination boards didn't change any of our grades, and CCEA changed 65% of the grades. Why? And the other aspect of this, as we're moving into, is does CCEA hold data on pupils in receipt of free school meals, pupil out outcomes? So an impact assessment can be carried out as to what demographic factors of candidates have been most impacted by the use of a flawed system, that is, gender, free school meal, ethnic groups. And the other point raised is if there's any differential between the um, algorithm or model devised by PwC for 100,000 um, if there's any differential between grammar schools and non-selective schools, there's a, a, the, and of course there's the impact on the mental well-being, as I referred to, of already stressed pupils and their parents. Uh, just very briefly, yeah. Uh, just a question on, is, was it P, for clarity? Was PwC were paid a hundred thousand pounds? Yeah, that's that's my understanding of it. Yes, um, that's my understanding. That was I read that in the media somewhere. Uh, however, but that's for I suggest that those matters are best dealt with through an inquiry at, at the committee, or possibly the, the uh, public accounts committee. That may well be best referenced there. However, we are at the position now, and the minister would uh, I'm sure this has been repeated. So, uh, give me a wee bit of forbearance in this. We are at the position now where CCEA must get those results out as soon as is humanly possible. Members, time's really up. frantic. And um, special education needs, schools reopening the, and the requirement for that, but also the need for additional university places to accommodate those who have been left out so far. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Member. Good okay, and I, know I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too welcome you back uh, to chairing the proceedings in the Assembly, uh, and indeed Deputy Speaker Patsy McLone back to the Chamber. I, in turn, will be freer to speak from this side of the, of the chamber, where I was perhaps curtailed in the past. Uh, I, I too support the motion as amended. Um, the original motion reflects the community's concern at the awards which were originally made by SIA in a process which was approved by the Department and the Minister. A flawed process. Clearly, it was a flawed process. I'm waiting for an A-level result is a stressful time at the best of times, but even more so whenever you haven't set an exam and there was the uncertainty of an algorithm that was going to be governing the final results. So there was a huge responsibility to ensure that due diligence was carried out, and it appears to me that that is not the case. It was more governed by restricting increases to a 2% increase, um, and as a result, Many students were downgraded, which, in my opinion, clearly should not have been downgraded. And that has been incredibly stressful to those uh, students, to their families. Many have thought that their future careers were, were, uh, were lost. So I'm pleased that there was that dramatic U-turn uh, yesterday 
and since we've seen. And why do I say there were flaws? I'll give you examples of some of the students that's been reported to me. One history student. Uh, at AS, they had got a C. In their mock A-level, they got a B. They were predicted a B. They were awarded an E. They've been improving, but the result was significantly worse. Another student who had double award science, a B, B and a C. Again, they were predicted a B and a C. They got a D and an E. But perhaps the most surprising one I've come across is a student studying government and politics. And all along, they had been reaching A grade attainment levels. They got an A in their mock. Their teacher was predicting an A. And they were awarded a C. I mean, anyone who would have looked at the individual assessments would have been questioned, what is going on here? This was not right. Again, another student who got an A at their GCSE examination was being predicted for a B, they were awarded a D. So I think there's clear evidence that there were obvious flaws which should have been spotted and picked out. And yes, there, there potentially was an, a, an a appeals mechanism, but why did all those students have to go through the trauma when there was obvious flaws in the systems? That was a fault that was at the core of what was happening. Yep. I thank the member for giving way. Um, the member across stated that the minister acted on Thursday once he was aware of the issue, when in fact SIA contacted principals on Wednesday, um, uh, who were, were, as they knew about the flaws, and in fact Scotland should have been a red alert. Uh, would the member agree with me that the minister uh, waited too long to rectify the situation? The member has an extra minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I agree entirely that. Uh, this should even have been apparent uh, before the community uh, became aware and were uh, up in arms about the results that were happening, which were causing undue stress to children, uh, their students, their parents. Uh, and it appears to me what was governing it, this, uh, this algorithm, and a tip to the Education Committee, use the 1998 Act and get the algorithm. You're entitled to it. Uh, they, they, it's important that there's transparency what was going on. It appears to me that some students were being assessed on previous school groups who may not have been reaching the same levels of attainment, and also the fact they were being ranked within their, their group irrespective of where the group level was. So they were being marked down, uh, and not, the mark were not reflecting their personal situation and personal track record. Turning to the amendment, uh, it, it's, it's clear to me that uh, we need to now move on. I'm pleased the Minister did his U-turn, I have said, but the job is not finished yet. Students are presently been given their new, new awards, I'm pleased, but all students must get those final predictor uh, awards from their teachers as soon as possible. When is that going to be? It's not over then. The problem then moves on to our higher education facilities. Who are they going to accept? Sadly, some uh, uh, conditional offers which were made have been withdrawn. What is going to happen to those students? There needs to be clarity. Uh, are the universities going to be able to accept uh, and fulfil those original awards that they made? Uh, and I think it would be totally unfair if a student was awarded a grades which they thought would get them into university for their desired course if they were not going to get in. So it's essential that the Department of Education the Department of the Economy, the Executive, and our universities all work closely together to give uh, clarification as quickly as possible so that each of these students uh, can learn uh, and get to the, the course that they wish to uh, as soon as possible and move on in their careers. And we also must learn and ensure that this does not happen again. Uh, I hope that the Minister is already putting in processes to ensure that students will have examinations next year and that we will not be relying on such a flawed system uh, which has caused so much controversy. I would have thought that when schools were, were empty during the process, in hindsight, hindsight is a wonderful thing, that it would have been possible to have had uh, examinations uh, uh, and that undoubtedly would have been better than some form of, of prediction. Uh, so I welcome the fact that we've changed and ask the Minister and the Executive and the Universities to move forward quickly as possible to finalise what our students are going to be doing. Thank you. And I call Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And like everyone else, I would first of all like to welcome you back to your place. It's, it's good to see you and it's been a, uh, I'm sure it's been a, a, I'm sure it's welcome to see you back. Um, 
I rise, uh, as with others in my party and indeed others across the House, to support both um, uh, the motion uh, and the amendment. Obviously, um, we proposed it and have worked with other parties to develop them, so I'm going to support them. Um, I'd first of all like, as other people have, to um, congratulate the Minister on, um, on making this decision. I understand that um, uh, in politics it can, be, uh, it can be sometimes difficult to, um, to, to, to change your position under extreme pressure, so I welcome that he had the, you know, he had the uh, maturity to do that. I do, um, it worries me that it took the Minister so long to do that. It worries me that his decision came only after the increasingly chaotic Education Secretary uh, for England, Gavin Williamson, made a similar decision. As others have said, it simply can't be the case that public policy outcomes for our young people, uh, or indeed for anyone else in Northern Ireland, are dictated by what the Conservative government uh, in London do first. I'll try and be brief in my remarks, but the Minister has said over the last few days, and indeed uh, several, DUP, several DUP MLAs have repeated today, that one of the primary motivations for this decision was um, the decision to ensure similar treatment to students in other parts of the UK. Um, Yes, it is important to ensure that our young people are treated not worse than, um, than those against whom they are competing for university places. I speak myself as someone who went to university in Scotland. Um, but I have to repeat, as others have done, if the Minister thinks that the only good reason for performing this U-turn is to give us consistency with England, Scotland and Wales, with, re with the greatest of respect, and I do say respecting the, the enormous pressure I'm sure he's been under in the last few days, he hasn't understood the intensity of feeling on the issue. And this wasn't just about uh, being treated the same as English, Welsh and Scottish students. It was about addressing a very profound sense of injustice felt by individual students at being downgraded, not based on work that they had done, but based on an algorithm they had never seen. Indeed, most of us have never seen. Uh, I understand, and it's worth acknowledging again, that there was never going to be an, an ideal or easy outcome uh, to, the, to the exam question once schools were closed and exams cancelled. But the truth is that absolute statistical consistency and focus on stopping any grade inflation, uh, as it's called, was the wrong approach in such an anomalous and unique year. Christopher Stalford, who's now left the chamber, was right. He said, we have asked a huge amount of our young people during the COVID-19 crisis, particularly those who are going through exams. But that's why it was all the more important that we did our absolute best for them through the examination process. And I acknowledge the minister will have made his decision through what he believes are the best things for the system and for students. But that was why it was all the more important that we, um, they having faced the extraordinary injustice of being denied schooling, the first generation since universal second level education to have been denied en masse their schooling, it was all the more important um, that we did the absolute best for them. The truth was that there is a sense of random injustice created by the COVID-19 crisis, which has limited all of our lives. It's a, um, an extraordinary uh, imposition on our lives. It's created extraordinary disruption, and they have felt it m more than any. But that's why it was even worse in a sense, to create the random injustice of an algorithm rather than uh, judging them on work that they had done and the, and the judgments of their uh, teachers. Um, uh, I'm glad that various parties in the Assembly came together, inspired by, indeed, demanded by uh, young people and our families. As I've said, this is not a perfect solution, in part because there are no perfect solutions. There's no good outcome in these circumstances. Having said that, lots of young people and their families will be relieved and will have been relieved over the last 12 and 24 hours to be in a better position than they were. But this does throw up very significant short-term challenges um, that I know the Minister will be working on. They've been covered by others. Among the short-term challenges ensure, include insist, in, ensuring that we get the updated grades, uh, predicted grades to students as quickly as possible and that the exams transition process uh, to university works as quickly as possible, but there are lots of other challenges that the Education and the Economy Committees are going to have to examine. But this also does throw up really stark long-term lessons about our education system and how it fails our young people. I'm afraid Robin Newton, the former Speaker, said earlier on that we have one of the best education systems in the world. Bluntly, that isn't true. Some of the inequalities thrown up by this process have underlined inequalities that existed in the past. I know the Minister has has commissioned a group to look at educational inequalities. I welcome that. But if this process does anything, let us make it look hard at what we want out of our education system right from 11 through to university, including the cap on student numbers, because Members that does up. lead to unfortunate outcomes and dampens down our productivity. So in welcoming today's motion, I say we have short and long-term challenges to focus on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan.
much indeed, Mr. Speaker, and may I join with the rest of our party present here in welcoming you back. And also to the SDLP, uh, John Hume was indeed a colossus, a colossus on both the Northern Ireland and the global political stage, and his advice and guidance will be very much missed, and very much indeed from our party as well. Um, Mr. Speaker, many people have already talked today about the implications of what has happened over this A-level debacle and fiasco. And I don't wish to join in a, an attack and a criticism on the Education Minister. I think it is vitally important we get to the bottom of what happened. And the first thing, as our learned friend from South, uh, South Belfast talked about, is the importance we need to recognise that we are in the midst of a COVID pandemic. We are not in normal times. But despite the fact we are not in normal times, we have known all along that the GCSEs, AS and A-level results were going to come out. We have known for many months that this situation was going to occur. Indeed, as we have already heard, that we have probably spent a considerable amount of money with PwC creating an algorithm to look at these problems. This just did not happen over one or two days. This happened over a considerable period of time. We are in a situation here when the Assembly is being asked to look at a system that resulted, unless, until the changes happened on Monday, when our young people would have been significantly disadvantaged. Not just disadvantaged for now, not just disadvantaged for the coming year, but for the rest of their lives. I am a tender age that where I am still being asked, if I put my name in for a board or a board position, what my A-level results were, what my GCSE results were. I never did AS levels. But that is the kind of implications of the problems that we have had in Northern Ireland. And there are substantial questions of leadership here that must be answered. And our party will join in the process of asking to make sure there is a full and thorough investigation to this. But there are some questions here that are fundamental that need to be asked, and I want the Minister to ask them. We know that our own universities ran a model to look at the likely number of students they were going to have in July. It used A-levels, it used AS grades, it used teachers' predictions. It was fundamentally different to the model that SEA was using. Why were the alarm bells not ringing at that stage, Minister? Why were your special advisers and why were your members of your department not saying there is something fundamentally flawed and there is something fundamentally wrong? This did not come out of the blue. We have had the incident of what happened in Scotland, where the Education Minister in Scotland, even though they had the advice two weeks beforehand that this was going to be a substantial problem, realised and they had to do a U-turn. The fact that we had to wait for so long for a U-turn to occur has meant that our students right now don't even know if they're going to go to university this year, who had already received conditional offers, but they can't go now. And there are students who are at university who have received conditional offers who are about to go who don't know if that's going to be overturned or potentially overturned by some form of judicial process. This has been a fundamental failure. And I know in Northern Ireland we don't seem to hold anybody accountable or responsible for anything. But on this occasion, somebody must be accountable and responsible for what has happened to our students in Northern Ireland, to our parents and to our teachers. And it's teachers I would like in my last minute to really talk about. Because teachers were asked, because of COVID, because of all the difficulties that they are, to use their best professional judgment. They were asked to look at what the likely grades were going to be for students for AS and A-levels. They were told that they had to be especially rigorous. They had to look in significant detail. They had to make sure that everything they did in their process was rigorous. They were also asked to look at a merit order of their pupils within their school, of where they sat within various, uh, with various subjects. Now, when that went to the algorithm to be run through the computer, the universities used what the teachers said best on their best professional judgment on their qualifications, but SIA used what was the merit ranking system. But we don't know any more details of this because for a bit like the emails that seem to be materially never arriving about PPEs or anything else, 
This is in some form, seems to be some form of a secret. Members, time's up. And thank you very much indeed, and we will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome you back and share condolences to the wider SDLP family. Today, all of this could be avoided. Yesterday's decision is a welcome result of the voices of teachers, parents, pupils and students, and credit to them for demanding an equitable resolution. Recent events have brought incredible distress. There will not be one MLA here who has not been contacted asking for help. But every summer we deal with students who are not treated fairly by the system, so this is not a new issue. We have the worst levels of students leaving education with no qualifications. The grades, the algorithms, the workings out that, we're been discussed, that have been discussed for the last couple of days and here today are actually children and young people's lives. So let's take a moment and think about the educational journey that they could have been on. Hopefully our child gets a nursery place with good quality funded childcare, but without properly early years provision or a childcare strategy, maybe our young person's start in life is not as good as it needs to be. Then our child attends school at aged four separately and the earliest in Europe. Some will be able to get their first preference at primary school, others won't. Maybe our young person has recognised special educational need or will spend years trying to get statemented. They receive a uniform and a free school meals payment. Maybe the school is underfunded and under-resourced. Then on to big school, maybe our young person didn't do or didn't do well enough in the transfer test to get into the school their friends are going to. And maybe they get a place in our third or fourth preference school or whatever place they can actually get because all the others were oversubscribed. Maybe they face other barriers. Maybe they don't feel like they fit in and they're subject to bullying like nearly half our students are here in Northern Ireland. Maybe they have freckles or maybe they're not as tall as their other peers like me. Or maybe they're LGBTQ. Maybe they have a disability or maybe they don't have English as their first language. Maybe the young person is a carer too or has additional at-home responsibilities or is in care themselves. Maybe they're one of the 25% of children that are growing up in poverty in Northern Ireland, one of the 103,000, with families struggling to make ends meet, impacted by austerity and horrific social security, so-called reform. Maybe the young person doesn't get a nutritious meal at the end of the day. Maybe they're one of the 15,000 children that were fed using an emergency food package last year alone. Maybe they have additional needs. Maybe there's abuse in the home, maybe drug or alcohol addiction. Perhaps our young person is one of the 35,000 who went to CAMS for mental health support in 2018. Perhaps there are one of the one in 10 in the classroom that have a diagnosable mental health illness. But despite all barriers that our young person could have faced, they've managed to get to the examination stage this year, working hard to deal with COVID, with lockdown and adapting to the new normal. That is if they have the technology in place to do so or the support networks at home. So on top of everything else that we demand from our children and young people as a society, and regardless of COVID, an unjust system is imposed that standardises them and bases their academic performance in part on the basis of other people, some who they've never met and not the individual's work. Some defended a system which most of us do not understand, let alone did we get sight of it, rather than defending our children and young people. And we talk much about ACEs and supporting our young people, about educational underachievement, but the current approach is embedding division and disadvantage further, ensuring the divide continues. Our job as public servants is to serve the next generation and not to destroy it. And I'd like to remind our young people that exam results do not make you as a person. They are not the whole picture and they will not wholly determine everything that you do in your life. There are certainly no exam qualifications that you need to be in this chamber. Last year, 158 young people left school with no GCSEs and 131 left with no formal qualification of any kind. So how many this year? How many next year? School leavers entitled to free school meal payments are twice as likely to be recorded as unemployed after they leave. If the Minister's prime concern remains that young people in Northern Ireland are not disadvantaged, then why were we dragged through this mess and what are we going to do? What are the executive's plans to address the inequalities evident in the figures of our school leavers? Will there be a review about what happened this year? Will there be an impact assessment published? Will there be an inquiry? What about next year? What about the AS levels? What about university places and clearing? But this is not just about grades. This is about a totally unfair system 
and the need for long-term transformation from assessment and qualifications that must happen and an executive that actually does something practical about it. Thank you. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, it has been interesting for me to observe the internecine blame game between the executive parties. But make no mistake about it. This is a shambles made instalment. Not the first, and I fear not the last. And the Minister, I do welcome the fact that eventually he came to the point of U turn. But I do remain critical of the fact of the blindness and the deafness of the Department and the Minister to the problem for so long. What everyone else could see on Thursday, the Minister denied. What everyone else could see on Friday, the Minister denied. And eventually, on Monday morning, he came to the realisation that he was on untenable ground, shrinking ground as well, of course, and he had to make the U-turn on the GCSEs. But even in making that U-turn, he compounded the insult to teachers in our community because he accepted that teacher grades for G GCSE were the appropriate benchmark and decider, but persisted in saying not so from the same teachers in respect of A-levels. And then belatedly on Monday, when the ground was removed totally from Balloam, he came to accept that as well. It was that deafness and that blindness to the problem which I think was the greatest weakness that the Minister showed in all of this. And I do want to commend the very many pupils, parents and teachers who campaigned with great effect and who secured what was rightfully theirs from the beginning eventually. I want to commend them for that and for the vigour and determination that they showed. Now, of course, we're at the halfway point of this crisis. We're at the point now where there are university places which had been dangled to students because of these perverse SEER results were snapped away from them. And now the question is, can they be returned to them? And of course, it is vital that those who have now got the rightful grades that they were first denied also get the university places that to this point they have been denied. And that will take extra funding. And yes, Sinn Féin, who ridicule about following the GB examples, are of course going to be the first party with their hand out for the funding to enable that to happen. Because of course it's going to be on the back of Barnet Consequentials, I suspect, that extra funding is going to be provided, not just for this year, because these are three and four year courses, but for future years. And that must be done if there is to be salvage from this some degree of equity and some degree of fairness for our students. But it's not just a matter of leaving it there. How did we get here? Is SIA fit for purpose? I think that's a question that needs to be asked because it wasn't just the minister who defended SIA. The chief executive of SIA could not have been more bullish in his defence of this indefensible system. Yes? It's me that there are serious questions uh, to be raised about the secrecy that surrounds the SIA process, particularly on this occasion, which has shone a very bright light on how they function. I agree, absolutely. And I do trust, that the, education, thank you, I do trust that the Education Committee in this House will now take up the cudgels on this issue, will conduct an investigation how we got here, how, whether SIA is fit for purpose, and what lessons are to be learned. It's not a matter that can be let rest. And I do wonder, the Minister was very 
effusive in his support for Sia. Did the minister, and if he did, it compounds his folly, did the minister have complete sight of the algorithm which has failed? Or did he leave it to Sia? And in leaving it to Sia, was he let down? I think those are questions we need to have the answers to. So I think there is blame in various quarters, and I certainly do not exempt SIA. It's not the first time SIA has messed up on exams. Far lesser scale in the past, but not the first time. And I think there needs to be a long, hard, vigorous look at SIA to see exactly where uh, things went wrong. But fundamentally, in all of this, we should be thinking about the students and the pupils and the unnecessary distress that they were put through over last weekend should have been rectified before Thursday. Should at least have been rectified on Thursday. But instead of that, students were hung out to worry and their Members, parents time is up. to despair over what all their efforts had been for. That was wrong. I thank the member, and I call Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome you back and wish you good health in the, in the period ahead. And I want to thank the members for bringing this uh, motion uh, to the House today. Uh, many have acknowledged the recent U turn on A level and GCSE results as a good decision. Uh, we and people before profit recognise it uh, for what it is a forced decision. Of course, uh, a well done is in order for forcing the U turn, but not for the Minister. I say well done to the pupils who gathered in protests, not just here but across the water. And well done to the parents and teachers who used every platform available to them to rebuke the disastrous situation we had and saw last week and to stand up for our young people and their futures and organisations such as NUS, USI, Secondary Students Union and many, many others. This uh, situation, uh, Mr Speaker, has exposed many deeper problems within our education system, as has been alluded to already, whether it is the division of children on the basis of academic ability or the expectation by the state that children in impoverished areas should underperform compared to their counterparts in more affluent areas. These issues and others, such as the outdated division of pupils on the basis of their religion, remain, but I am encouraged that those in the education system are up for the fight for a better system with proper investment, even if those in charge of the system are not. I am sure many of those people who are rooted in our education system recognise that the COVID crisis uh, has had an incredibly challenging impact uh, for the sector and that navigating this crisis uh, was never going to be easy. I am sure many of those people, including the pupils uh, themselves, would have understood if the response to the situation was that of a humbled minister who recognised the gravity of the error made and who moved swiftly to rectify it. They did not deserve a double-down response, but is exactly what they got. I was appalled, Mr Speaker, as I know parents, teachers and pupils were, to hear the Minister say that if teachers' predictions were used alone without standardisation, the results would have no credibility. What the stain shown for our teachers and teaching staff? And it is this level of arrogance which has been thematic in the approach to schools during this crisis. Initially, when this Assembly refused to shut schools down to protect communities, forcing principals and teachers to act, then totally disregarding the planning and experience, putting the design and phase returns to the new school terms, to minimise the spread of the virus by commanding full openings with little consultation. And now, this latest example, undermining the intensive work put in by teachers to guarantee to the best of their ability that their pupils would get the grades they deserve by deeming their efforts to have no credibility. It is no wonder that there is a lack of trust in the attentions or the ability uh, of the Minister by the many teachers who have spoken out publicly. Um, I, too, am unconvinced that the arrogance displayed during this crisis is befitting of an education minister, that the unwillingness to listen or consult properly with those in the system who understand the needs of pupils best is appropriate for the person responsible for making decisions about their future. I had tried to have an amendment tabled here today which calls on the Minister to resign after what I believe are a series of disastrous decisions during this crisis, most the result of blindly following the path of Boris Johnson's government, rather than catering a response 
uh, based on the needs of people here. This most recent disaster decision should be a final nail in a ministerial coffin. It is time for a new chapter in our education system, which recognises the problems and mistakes of the past, which seeks to properly invest in its future and the future of all our young people, and which gives primacy to the needs and experience of those rooted in the education system. I am asking other MLAs uh, to join me in kick-starting that new chapter today by calling on the person responsible for the disastrous handling of this uh, crisis during COVID-19 to have the good grace to step aside. But unfortunately, I have not been allowed to debate that uh, today. But I am still making the same call, and I hope others will join me in calling for the Minister's resignation uh, today. And It is not just me saying it. Um, for the House to know, uh, a principal has been in touch of a school and has said the following about the Minister. His disgraceful handling of this whole crisis has caused school leaders more stress than the actual health crisis itself. His arrogance, flippancy and clear disdain for the education workforce has left us feeling unsupported and a constant loggerheads with a man who was elected to give us support and guidance. Peter Weir is not worthy of his brief and school principals do not trust him with the safety and well-being of our pupils and staff. He needs to go. Indeed, Minister, do the right thing. Step aside. Thank you. And I now call the Minister uh, for Education. And can I advise you, Minister, that you have 25 minutes to respond? Uh, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I think before we get into the meat of the debate, um, I welcome you back from your isolation. I'd also pass on to the SDLP uh, my condolences in relation to the passing of John Hume. I appreciate that, um, that there will be an opportunity at a later date for that to be dealt with in a much uh, longer and more appropriate manner, but I felt it was important to place on the, the record. Let me also say I think that it's been useful in this debate uh, that, uh, given I think the uh, advice that the Speaker made at the beginning of this debate, that there will be many young people watching this, perhaps watching the Assembly for the first time, that, largely speaking, the tone has been one which has been calm and sensible in what is potentially a very emotive um, issue. There may be some exceptions to that, that tone, but broadly speaking, I think across the chamber uh, that has been the case. And I think it is important. We will talk about systems. We will talk about numbers. Um, we will talk about statistics. But I think all of us acknowledge uh, that behind anything that is trying to be done are individuals, and particularly we are dealing with young people and indeed their futures. And that, I think, has been at the foremost in my mind. And I think, look, irrespective of whether different people here will have had disagreements over what I've done or taken a different uh, point of view, I think that is the case for the vast majority of people within this chamber and beyond. So I, I do welcome this opportunity to deal with this issue and debate it today um, and looking at the decisions that, that have been made. Let, let me say at the outset that the COVID pandemic has inflicted much suffering and hardship on our society. And many of our young people have had to face difficulties across different aspects of their lives. And I understand that anxieties. And I can see that for some, the A-level results process has been very upsetting. Now, I think we do need to put this within the context as well of even given the results, which even prior to the changes that were made, we do have to, there is important to put a few facts a little bit on the, the table. Uh, whenever the A-level and AS-level results were announced last week, it is important to note that they were up from 2019, that there was a rise in terms of whether it's A star to C within uh, A-levels of 1.6%, 2.2% on the similar basis of A to C within AS-levels, and I know that um, a number of members have talked about the long tail of underachievement on A levels, and this, there was a similar there was a level of drop within AS levels as well. Of those who were awarded a U grade, um, that has gone down from 1.7%, even before the adjustments that will take place as a result of yesterday, from 1.7% to 0.9%, less than 1%. Uh, of people have got that, that U grade. Mention has also been made about the impact, particularly from a socio-economic point of view. And while data in terms of free school meals and the particular impact on individuals on that basis is not directly held, what we did see last week, and even on the basis of those, those results, and there will be changes made as a result of yesterday's announcements, we saw that within the A-levels that non-selective schools uh, 
performed, relatively speaking, better than the grammar schools in terms of closure of the gap. Uh, and similarly, there was a very dramatic increase in terms of uh, the A level, AS level results, uh, where uh, the selective schools improved by 1.7%, and within the non-selective schools, uh, there was an improvement of 7.3%. The gap closed from around about 17% to around about 12%. So it is important, while we deal with the difficulties that have arisen in this year's uh, examinations, that we don't downplay or diminish uh, the anguish of those young people, but also important uh, that we acknowledge the successes where it has happened uh, for our young people and pay tribute to the work that they have done. Now, in March, we were facing unprecedented challenges. I, you know, I, I know that that, uh, in terms of the word unprecedented, has been a, a certain level of cliché, but simply because it's a cliché doesn't make it any less true as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. And amongst many others, it was decided by the executive that it was necessary to close our schools for an unspecified period of time. And I would say, I know that there are some who, who accuse me of simply following what is done uh, at Westminster in terms of the schools. Let me make it very clear in terms of whenever we were keeping schools open, when the decision was taken to close, when advice uh, was given in terms of partial reopening in June, and when the executive passed um, that further advice in August. On every occasion, the advice that was there was in line with what the Public Health Agency had said, what the position of the Chief Medical Officer had said, and if we are to decide things on health grounds, we have to go to those experts. With schools closed, it was not possible to continue with the summer examination series, and therefore it was vitally important that consideration was given to how best to provide our learners with certainty about the way forward as soon as practically possible. We, you know, there would have been the possibility of holding off until close to exam time to take a decision, but I think that that would have created a level of uncertainty. The worst possible scenario would have been to start examinations and in the middle of examinations uh, had to uh, take a completely different route. That meant in a very short window developing alternative means of awarding qualifications, qualifications that would both serve the long-term interests of our young people and ensure that they were able to progress this year into further or higher education or employment. Uh, we set out to provide a system that was fair and credible, and as I'll come to later, any system that was going to be put in will have problems with fairness. Indeed, any action that can be taken in any direction to try to be fair to one group of individuals within this system will, may well ease the particular problems that they face, but may have a corresponding and correlating um, action uh, that actually makes it less fair for others. So as much as possible, it was based on well-established examination processes, including standardisation to maintain standards over time, because it was also the case that the cohort from 2020, while they are facing very different situations, they, they've got to be stand in a position which enables comparisons to be made with other years, and also actually particularly for future years who will face some level of disruption. COVID meant that there was no established process to how to achieve this, so all processes had to be developed at a pace uh, as... Uh, yes, okay. I appreciate the Minister giving way. At the conclusion of this debate, Mr McNulty will rise to address the House. I think it's worth putting on the record what he had to say about the model. Mr McNulty said, I think the words you used were unique and unprecedented, and I think that's certainly true. We're in uncharted waters, and it's a bold model you've put forward, and how you've managed to devise it in such a short period of time you deserve major credit. I'm sure Mr McNulty will probably be working that statement into his, his concluding remarks. Uh, alternative arrangements uh, were put in place after careful consideration from a wide range of options put forward by SEA, and that took account of the views of education stakeholders and experts. These included head teachers, the Education and Training Inspectorate, and the teaching unions. Everyone recognised there was no perfect solution but the arrangements were the best available given the circumstances. I wanted uh, young people to have a solution uh, that gave them an outcome to move to the next stage of their lives in September, but also to protect the integrity of our qualification system and past and future cohorts. You know, this is not simply an abstract uh, concept. In Northern Ireland, we are a small region. If our qualifications are not seen as having any level of integrity, given our scale that would put our, uh, our students at a particularly difficult uh, situation. 
The standardisation process at A level differed from England in that pupils' uh, prior, uh, prior achievements at AS level provided the central focus of the standardisation process. Now, it, it is important to point out that in the majority of cases at A level, 58%, and at AS level, I think it was 62%, have ended up being the grades that students were, last, uh, were issued with last week. And indeed, at A-levels, at 96.6% of cases, it was either the same grade or there was one grade of a, a difference. What we have seen, understandably, is the roughly 3% where there has been a, a major divergence, where there has been, understandably, a focus uh, on that. Our examination system is not just important to young people's future, but also the future of our, our economy. Uh, and so employers need to have confidence in those qualifications presented when recruiting staff. Therefore, there's a responsibility to ensure the qualifications awarded this year are recognised as robust, reliable and an accurate reflection of the abilities of our young people. That was why standardisation was part of the uh, awarding arrangements developed. Uh, moderation and standardisation are important features of the qualifications awards process every year. Uh, modern, uh, modern, uh, moderation and standardisation are not new processes. They are annual processes which are widespread across all countries where examinations take place. But that, this is something which has happened in Northern Ireland and elsewhere for many, many years. So the concept that this has been something simply grafted on this year I think would be inaccurate. They help ensure that standards are maintained over time and that outcomes are fair and comparable across jurisdictions. In the UK, they've operated across the three juris uh, jurisdictions that share GCSE, AS and A-level uh, brands. Scotland has always adopted a different uh, examination system and indeed, for instance, does not offer A-levels. Important, uh, importantly, standardisation ensures that qualifications awarded in Northern Ireland are recognised as comparable to the qualifications awarded elsewhere. And it is also the case that when, we, when, developing, uh, when development was happening, in terms of the processes that were there, all the qualification bodies came to a very similar uh, position in terms of how awards were made. Mention has been made uh, specifically of the algorithm, and I think one of the problems uh, that has arisen is that when an algorithm is applied, particularly in terms of a standardization process, uh, where it tends to fall down is when it's applied to very small groups. In England, they tried to artificially uh, rectify that problem with the end result um, that uh, action was taken in terms of small groups, in terms of standardisation. And the impact of that, I think, was to unfairly favour independent schools. And in England, one of the criticisms that has been made is that the levels of um, improvement in results have been much greater in the uh, public school system, the independent school system, than across four comprehensives. So, you know, we've always got to be careful that where interventions take place, uh, they uh, sometimes can uh, create uh, circumstances which actually lead to undesirable results in relation to that. Now, members, while, while I mentioned the issue of, um, well, maybe it may well be dealt with in the, the next few remarks. But members have made, and I know um, the proposer and others have made reference to the algorithm and to have it published. I give a commitment to that uh, on Friday, as the member acknowledges, uh, and I give instructions to say I can confirm to members that the algorithm is now published on the CCEA uh, website. Uh, and so it is free for anybody to download, to print off, to examine, uh, and I'm sure not simply members of the uh, education committees, but others. Uh, will want to bring in, into place. Rank order was used within, the, uh, within this system. Rank order was provided by teachers. And I, I have to say, if, if the argument is that we see teachers' uh, predictions as being the, the critical element within this, we cannot, on the one hand, say we regard those as being uh, completely watertight and then rubbish rank order because the rank orders will come from the, the same teachers. Throughout this, the aim has been to try to create something which not only preserved integrity of the exams, but for everyone, created the greatest level of fairness. And the problem is that any system that is being adopted, it has flaws and it, uh, and it has drawbacks. We have seen in terms of the application of this process, 
that while on a broader system-wide basis it probably produced the overall level of results that would have been perhaps anticipated and created an overall position for Northern Ireland, uh, where it fell down clearly was some occasions within individual schools, within individual cohorts and particularly within um, individuals. And that was something I think which was unacceptable. To try to tackle that, uh, different uh, and indeed a similar position was found in other jurisdictions and there were different approaches taken. In Northern Ireland, the initial approach that I took was to ensure that we had then a widened appeals process. The appeals process is normally simply on the grounds of procedures, but uh, the appeals process was then directed so that anyone, including any individual, could show their, uh, their work uh, that if they had a level of prior attainment and show evidence of that, that would then be evidence for an appeal to be overtaken. That would allow every, every individual to be treated on merit rather than simply a blanket solution. Uh, mention is being made because I think there was a level, slight level of overhyping in England of what was called the, the triple lock. There, the only level of evidence that was offered was uh, mock results. We went much wider than that. And while it had been indicated that a mock result would simply overturn a result, when actually the fine detail was published uh, at various stages it then had to be withdrawn from Ofqual, it was the case that simply, as elsewhere, this was simply one aspect of, of evidence which may or may not lead to a change. What we had put forward was a level of um, opportunity for everyone to do that. Now, mention has been made about the level of appeals, and I appreciate that, that given circumstances there has uh, while appeals continue, uh, there has been obviously there will not be the, by any means, the need for appeals. To give members a level of, of figures, certainly before any decision was uh, finalised yesterday, um, out of about 24,000 uh, cases that had been, I'm sorry, 24,000 um, A level awards that came from CCEA, the figures were at that stage 948 had been appealed, which is a little bit under 4% of the overall total. So we also need to put that in a level of context. It is also the case that while a process has now been adopted for, uh, for GCSEs, A-levels and AS-levels, you know, uh, and I am not in any way attacking anybody, but that system also has its levels of flaws. If you do not have standardization, there is a level of grade inflation which shows that as a minimum, uh, that the number of uh, A-stars to C's at A-level will go up by more than 10% in a single year. Uh, within AS-levels by, um, I think the figure is 17%, uh, and while I think the figures will ultimately be lower in terms of GCSEs, and obviously those results are not out as yet, I'm not at liberty to say that. Uh, and it will undoubtedly be the case that, that while there is very good professional judgment has been made, you, know, you cannot, if you do not have standardisation, have a guarantee that, that one pupil in one school will be treated exactly the same as a pupil in another school. Look, that is simply human nature, and it would be the, it'd be the same if anybody was applying professional judgment in any situation. Some people will be more strict, some people will be more lenient, which means you do not have that necessarily, that level of fairness. And it is also the case, and, you know, and I appreciate the position that Mr O'Dowd, uh, for instance, had, had taken, uh, in relation to uh, bodies outside of Northern Ireland. Uh, I would disagree with them, but I think it may well be a debate for another day. But one of the decisions I think that also was of particular relevance to A-levels and A-S-levels in terms of providing that level of equality, whereas within GCSEs, around about 97 or around 98 per cent of GCSEs are set by CCEA. So we have, with a very small exception, largely an internal market in Northern Ireland. At A level and AS level, around one in five qualifications is, uh, is given by a board, mainly English with a, with a small number from the Welsh side, but a one in five. So if changes were to be made, and if Northern Ireland went entirely on a solo direction, uh, I had the power to make a change that could have affected the vast majority, 80%. And indeed, th those within that 80% who, had, uh, uh, who maybe had not got the grades that, that they deserved. But it would have meant that there was no equality between that 20% and others, because that is something that lay out to me. And so that was something I think also had to be borne in mind. Yes, I'll give away on that. Uh, thank you, Manish, for giving away. But do, do, 
Setting aside the broader debate around whether there should be one examinations board or multiple, is the Minister not concerned that he, as Minister, has no authority over those who are applying their words to our schools in this jurisdiction? It's about a, a legal position. And look, there is, it is also the case, and look, I'm sure we'll come back to this in another day in terms of, in terms of wider debate. It is also the case that, that there is an inextricable link. Look, I, you know, I appreciate that not every member will share the same level of concerns about that linkage. But for our students, we have always tried to create a three-country equivalence between England, Northern Ireland and Wales. And that is of significance both in terms of the examination boards, uh, the results, but also because, for example, we have such a large percentage of our, of our students go across to universities across the water. And so therefore having a, some level of, of linkage uh, is very important. And I think that if we were seen simply to be, um, if the member figures, upon ourselves alone on that basis and took a entirely um, a view that, that, that deviated from, from everything, I think in the longer run, the people who would suffer would be our, our students. So before moving on to discuss A-levels and AS-levels, I want to set out the rationale uh, that I've announced in terms of GCSEs. Uh, over the weekend, I've given careful consideration to advice from CCEA in relation to the imminent award of GCSEs. I took the decision over the weekend and announced on Monday that it would be in the best interest of our young people to change the original decision and direct CCEA to award all candidates with the grades that have been calculated by their teachers, the centre assessed grades. Doing that, I suppose there were a number of factors I've mentioned about the internal uh, Northern Ireland market, but also the fact that, that while there was a clear remedy that could be used in terms of the A-levels and AS uh, levels, which was a robust appeal system, given the fact that, that the level of evidence that was not going to be there in terms of individual achievement could be used to the same extent on GCSE, that would have rendered an appeals process very difficult, uh, very time-consuming, and created the risk that for a lot of uh, students uh, that they would have found themselves in the point at which uh, they wouldn't have got results before perhaps decisions would need to be made uh, some stage, even in September, indeed dragging into the autumn. And also given the fact that there was the methodology for GCSEs couldn't bring in the prior performance of, of individuals because there was no robust comparable data. Turning to AS and A, uh, and A levels, members, well, I, I've, I'm sorry, I've, well, uh, I mean, I'm happy to speak to the member, I've only got four minutes left, the member will, will appreciate in relation to that. Turning to AS and A-levels, uh, members will be aware that I directed CA to review all awards issued last week and issue a fret set of utilised uh, set of results based on the higher or the original standardised grade or the teacher assessed grade. Those who receive standardised grades that are higher than the centre assessed grades will retain the higher award. Now, while I believe it's the right thing to do in the current circumstances, I recognise that there is still importance of standardisation and comparability of grades across centres. So I think that that will be something that we will have to bring into play. Whatever concerns I had and have in relation to the level of, of fairness or equality within any of these things, you know, my principal concern was on the basis of ensuring that our young people were not treated in a disadvantaged manner compared to their peers elsewhere. So there was discussions between ourselves, between England, uh, Wales was taking a similar approach, and it was not simply a question of us following England, but whenever we have a situation that particularly the English market represents about 85% of, uh, uh, of the students within the UK as a whole, simply to be going on some solo direction uh, was not the case. So we ended up yesterday within, uh, we announced at exactly the same time as England, Wales announced roughly about an hour before us. But all, th all three nations were, were kept in step. And we now have whatever the other concerns that are there, uh, we now have a situation where all parts of the United Kingdom are on exactly the same position as regards all their qualifications. Now, I mentioned just briefly of uh, implications. There are implications which, which have not been mentioned, maybe of a less substantial nature than, than higher education, but there will be implications because of the levels of increase in the, the grade awards that will create issues for post-primary schools, for further education colleges, because there is likely to be a shift in terms of where pupils are looking to do. That is something that will need to be addressed. The principal problem has been uh, recognised within higher education particularly. But let us also make it very clear, and, and that I think will be a challenge to the executive, and I think the executive will have to seek, and I think there will have to be a UK-wide solution as part of that as well, because I think that level of funding cannot simply be plucked out of the air. 
But let us also be very clear on this. Had a different system been put in place from March and we had ended up then with a 95% uh, A star to C, there would have been a massive pressure in terms of the number of additional places at university because a larger number of, of students would have been in the position uh, here to seek those places. That will have an implication for the, the cap and all of us will need from whatever party to work together to be able to change that cap to provide that le additional level of funding. Briefly, just to deal with uh, a couple of other points, um, Mr O'Dowd mentioned about reopening of schools. I think one of the unfortunate aspects was that with all the focus that was there on examinations, last, uh, last week uh, there was a revised restart paper was sent out to all schools. Uh, it was comprehensive in nature and covered a 70, page, uh, 70 pages. Again, with the advice and guidance being absolutely consistent with the health advice we've given from, from public health agency. Because one of the lessons, and whether it's here or elsewhere, that I think has to be learned, is there is no substitute for having examinations themselves. It is the only thing which can be seen to be entirely robust uh, and fair. And going with that as we move ahead underlines, I think, the absolute necessity of having uh, a full return, a full safe return to school five days a week so that we can ensure our pupils, battered and bruised as they will be by the situation as regard COVID, are given the best possible chance for everybody to progress into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you, Minister. And uh, before I call uh, Justin McNulty to wind the motion, can I just remind uh, Mr. McNulty that the convention of members or ministers seeking to amend their motion are invited to address both the motion and the amendment together when moving and winding, and the member will therefore have 10 minutes. Gourmet Yogurt, Ken Carla, and welcome back. Good to have you in the hot seat, and hopefully conditions around COVID remain the same to allow you to stay here, and we've all got our part to play in ensuring that every, people remain safe in our society. Take responsibility in that regard. Um, I want to start by paying tribute to a hero of mine, John Hume. Um, whose funeral it was a huge honour for me to attend. As a member of a Guard of Honour, we weren't even able at the funeral because of the conditions, the COVID conditions and the circumstances around that. And it was sad maybe that John didn't get the send off that he deserved, um, but the family were so um, strong about following the guidelines. And it was a really, really dignified and beautiful send off for, for a hero to me, a hero to, too many, so, to so many people on this island. And, someone whose legacy we can all be proud of in this chamber and on this island. I rise to wind the SDLP motion and the SDLP amendment as tabled and debated here today. I want to thank you all the members for their very informed and passionate and measured contributions throughout this debate. As I see it, there are three groupings of pupils who, who are um, have been impacted in different ways by this grading um, crisis for some, for others not. Those who did well. There are those people who did well and their, their grades were not reassessed or will not need to be regraded and who got the marks they expected and who worked diligently for that. And I say to those people, well done, congratulations. There are those who were disgruntled about the grades they received. They were downgraded, um, 11,000 of them, and thankfully those grades are now going to be rectified. And um, I say well done to those students for their forbearance and for their patience and for their um, voicing of their, their, dis their disillusionment and for their support from their teachers, their principals, their parents. And the last grouping are those groups of students who did not so well, who will not be regraded, who didn't, um, didn't apply themselves to their course for whatever reason. And guys, I'm with you. My, my A-levels were downgraded, um, not by an algorithm, not by um, an anomaly, but because I didn't fully commit myself to education in school. Um, I was more focused on football and messing around. Um, but I won't say to those, group, those students, some of the most successful people I know didn't get their A-levels, didn't get their GCSEs. There are options open to you. You can take a, a, a further education um, approach. Good to have you back, Mr. Speaker. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Member, for giving way there to me. And um, we're debating this incredibly important 
uh, debate today which impacts on our young people and uh, we stand resolutely with those young people but I've asked her for you to give way for we need to send out that clear message that their futures doesn't depend Mr Speaker on exams set at 16, 18 or 11 years of age. Um, I left school at 15 I was very lucky that I was able to go into a bar in Moira, a public house called the Four Trees and I served an apprenticeship as it, as it was then. I now represent Moira as an MLA, so there is plenty out there with good hard work. What I'm going to say here is we need to send a clear message out to our young people across Northern Ireland. I know, Mr Speaker, I'll not be long. I think it's important that we embrace the young that, that, that haven't done as well as maybe they would have liked to. And I'd like to send for the future. It's not mapped out for them uh, by exam results, but with good hard work and dedication. And I, I ask this House also. Uh, to commend those entrepreneurs that are able to go out and start their own businesses. They are the wealth creators. And uh, thank you, Member, for giving away. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I absolutely agree. Results do not define these young people. The young people define these young people. Um, I'll quickly try and go through as many of the points made today as I can. Um, Daniel McCrossan, who brought the motion, um, talked about the impact on young people, teachers, principals, and parents, and how they came together to, to force this uh, vote fast. Um, he raised his frustration with the flawed system and the delays in recognising its failure um, and blindly following the lead of London. He wants visibility of the algor algor algorithm and is thankful that the Minister has said that's now available um, and has questioned the anomaly. Um, he also talked about access to university places and UCAS and how that is all going to be synchronised and coordinated now to ensure that the issues are addressed. Um, and I thank the, the efforts from teachers and, and pupils and uh, those people who have specific expertise in the area. An intervention from Cara Hunter was very important in terms of the impact on young people's mental health. Morris Bradley uh, spoke about unprecedented, unprecedented times enforcing unprecedented actions and thanked the efforts of teachers in, this, in the process. Karen Mullen talked about students being failed and the system where 11,000 pupils' grades were downgraded and teachers' knowledge and expertise was dismissed. Robbie Butler applauded this, the strong voices of people's parents and teachers, principals and even politicians in coming together and forcing this outcome. 11,000 grades need change. CCA must act with haste. Uh, Robbie also um, alluded to the preferred strong option of the, the sorry, the, the the strong impact of this anomaly on students who are previously, um, a, a particular student who was a previously a looked after child. And we have to recognise that there are those uh, young people out there who don't have an easy pathway through education and they need all the support and help they can get. Chris Little referred to um, startling inconsistency in the grades award and the awarding system, grades awarding system. Mr Little also referred to the uh, Minister's following of London's lead in school closures and on the awarding of grades. So a clarification on time skills and uh, consideration in relation to CCA awards of results and across and access to universities. Robin Newton said the education system has in second to, uh, second, so I'd say the education here is second to none. I think that's not an appropriate time to say that when, after in the midst of this fiasco. And I, I would concur with other members' comments in that regard that our educators are second to none. Our educators are world class. But this obviously demonstrates there are serious major challenges with their, with their education system. And we're exporting so many of our young people abroad every year and building only, only the diaspora instead of our, our knowledge pool here. Catherine Kelly questioned why children in the north of Ireland are um, held ransom to a decision by a British minister in London. Chris Dalford said no one could have foreseen the circumstances that we faced here today as a result of a global pandemic and the impact of pupils throughout the, through reduced class time. Well, lots of people foreseen it, including my colleague Daniel McCrossan. Kiva Archibald criticised the minister for defending an algorithm, misleading of, uh, misleading of defending the hopes Sorry, defending the, defending the hopes and dreams, instead of defending the hopes and dreams of our young people. Sorry, I can't even read my own writing. I need to go back to school. Um, Sinead McLaughlin said, we have done um, our young people a great disservice, and she put major emphasis on the Maslin cap, and that's a new surrounding neck of students here for, for only benefiting the Norse diaspora, um, breaking up families and draining the talent pool here. 
We need to restructure the system here as, as the system as it stands is not fit for purpose. Rosemary Barton referred to uh, the algorithm on the lives of, sorry, the, un, the impact of an unseen algorithm on the lives of pupils and young people. John O'Dowd um, empathised with the position of the Minister for Education, saying he has been there, done that, and worn the T-shirt. He referenced the external exams boards uh, selling examinations to our schools and proposed only one exams board here. Kelly Armstrong paid tribute to pupils and um, teachers and the students and teachers unions and their dignified response to this crisis. Pat Smith-Long queried why did CCA change 65% of grades and will an equality impact assessment be carried out to establish if pupils from non-selective schools or disadvantaged areas are have been discriminated as part of this process. Roy Beggs questioned the awarding system as it is clear to anybody that there were obvious flaws in the, in, the, in the system. Matthew O'Toole approached uh, the approach of preventing any grade from uh, being inflated in this year of all years was the wrong approach to adopt. The random injustice of an algorithm was very unfair. Um, the questions still remain. Amongst them, when will the results be revised by CCA? When will all students be accepted onto their, their first choice course? when they get their, their grades. Will the Maslam cap be lifted by the universities so universities can accommodate more, greater numbers? There are, there are numerous questions still remaining, but I think what's, what's most pertinent in my mind is this is an outlier year. This is an outlier year. And we've all talked about the unprecedented um, nature of this, this virus and the impact on education, the impact on exams. Let this be an outlier year of opportunity for our young people where they see this year and remember this year as the year which gives them the foot up to go and make, to, meet, to, to, to achieve their dreams, achieve special things. And that's not necessarily just down the educational path, but let this be an outlier year where our young people get a leg up and be, let it be an outlier year of opportunity. Thank you very much, Member. Thank you, Member. Um, the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Daniel McCrossan and Justin McNulty be made. All those in favour say aye. Can't really know. I think the ayes have it. Um, the ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. The motion as amended is now passed. Thank you, members. Um, the question is that the uh, before put the, the next item on the agenda is item three on the order paper, the adjournment. So before I put the question, I remain members that the next plenary sitting of the Assembly is anticipated to be on Monday the 7th of September. The Business Committee will meet on Wednesday the 2nd and order papers will issue after that. During the remaining recess period, meetings of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response may be scheduled. Where this occurs, members will be notified in advance in the usual way. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you all.